Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Farid, and I'm one of the faculties in the engineering department. We really appreciate you spending your Friday morning with us. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our 2019 senior design presentations. Um, today we have eight groups of students who will be presenting their senior design projects. These projects started August of last year. So they have been working on these projects for the last nine months. There has been a lot of dedications, a lot of time that have been spent to complete this project, and we really appreciate all the efforts that the students have put to complete the, these projects. We also like to thank all of our faculty, in particular our industry advisors, which I will name them later, uh, for helping the students, mentoring them, and guiding them as they went through completing their project. Um, I wanted to make sure everyone has a list of their presentations, so if anybody needs one, Kate, has, can, Kate can give it to you, and uh, please let us know. Um, also, each presentation is limited to 15 minutes, and then it's followed by eight minutes of Q&A. We like to see if we can stay on time, but we do expect that some people may have more questions, but we apologize in advance if we have to cut you off and then kind of keep going to the next group because we really like to finish this thing at 12.30. We also like to tell you guys, especially if those of you who are our alumni, that we actually have a reunion right after these. Uh, at, starting at one o'clock, and we hope that you guys stay with us, and we really like to chat with you after this. So with that, um, I also, someone mentioned that please, if it's possible, kindly uh, consider turning off your cell phone so the students can go through their presentation smoothly. So now, without any further ado, I would like to uh, invite our first presenters, and thank you so much, come on in. She is. No. It's okay, we keep looking at this. Yeah. Uh, oh, there we go. I got it, guys. Oh. And then she's going to present them. How do I? I can't, I can't even see it on here. Uh, sorry, this is just a little bit too difficult. Okay, well welcome guys, welcome. Thank you so much to everyone here taking time out of your day to come and watch us and show us, show off all our hard work. With that being said, we are Smart Animal Trap and I am Richard Mitz. I'm Edwin Tran. And I'm Taylor Plorine. And our advisors were Dr. Chris Hawley, Shiva Kumar, and Dr. Free Faraman. Uh, so here's a little overview of what we're going to be discussing today. We have the problem that exists currently, our solution to this problem, our proposal to this problem, some marketing and engineering requirements we went over with our customer, uh, our software hardware design, some challenges that we faced along the way, the tests that we conducted along the way, and then finally our schedule that we planned out and any future works that we have considered. So what is the problem? There's two major problems. The first major problem as discussed is wild pigs. Wild pigs are an extremely uh, invasive species that destroy small ecosystems and tons of crops. They populate really quickly and there's no natural predator to them. So as humans, we're the only thing that can take care of them. There's also a problem with the traps that are currently catching them. A lot of them are out in remote areas. So they're, you, know, you have to drive out far to go check them and they're very unsustainable in that sense. Uh, they're expensive and they're not automated. <clears throat> Uh, existing solutions out there. Uh, as discussed with one of our advisors, there's some current research being done on an image recognition device that allows you to see whether it's a pig in there, it opens a bait box with poisonous bait in it, allowing the pig to eat it. Obviously, that's cruel and unsustainable and can lead to further poisoning of animals, so unnecessary. There's also a few gate and controllers in the, on the market. That's the gate controller and camera by Hog Tech, the mine trapping system by Jaeger Pro. Both of these are not fully autonomous and extremely expensive. 
All right, so this is what we are going to be proposing. We propose to have a universal automated trap that will catch only wild pigs and send a notification to the owner. The benefits of this cage and this system will be that it's accurate, automated, convenient, and more sustainable for the environment. This will be benefiting our customer, the Fairfield Osborne Preserve, as well as other consumers such as the USDA, wineries, and commercial landowners. And then this is a general d image of our device. So as you can see in the image on the left, yeah, on the left, that is a prototype of our end-to-end -end system. The image on, in the middle and on the bottom right show the user notifications that are sent through Twitter. And then in the image on the top right, that is a picture of the user interface using the UB.Dots cloud system. Here are some of the requirements uh, given to us by our customer. Um, our first market requirement is that our pig trap should automatically close when it's highly confident there's a pig inside the cage. And from there, a message should be sent using the, um, to the user's phone notifying the owner of the trap's closure. The trapping system should be able to run for an un um, unattended for a long period of time, and the owner will be able to look up information regarding the capture on the, on the cloud. And some of the engineering requirements that go with this is that we're using a Raspberry Pi 3B along with a motion sensor and a 2.5 volt push-pull solenoid. Um, Via Wi-Fi, we're using Twitter and email to go send that notification to the user. And using solar panels, we're charging a battery pack, which will also power the whole system. So this is the general overview of our hardware design. As you can see, we have a solar panel charging a rechargeable battery connected via micro USB to USB cable. And then that rechargeable battery powers an embedded system connected via USB cable to micro USB cable. A motion sensor is connected to the embedded system and it allows the system to detect whether or not there is motion inside the cage. There is also an LED which will turn on when necessary for when a picture is being taken, a camera to take a picture of what is inside the cage, and an LCD to display on-site per or peripherals when the user is on-site. When the image has been processed inside of the embedded system using the image recognition software that's installed, an email and Twitter notification will be sent to the user. Also, the embedded system will connect to the internet to upload any cage activity to the UB.Dots cloud. If a pig has been confirmed inside the cage, it will activate a, a, the push-pull solenoid to drop the cage door. Here's a little look at our software design. So when the device is started, there's a startup script that waits for motion sensors. And to get rid of false positives, it waits for five motion detections. And from there, it'll check the time of day. During daytime, it won't bother to do anything. But at nighttime, it'll turn on the LEDs to get a better picture for better image recognition. From there, it'll take a picture and it'll run through our TensorFlow uh, software, which will decide what the image is. And if it's a pig, it'll decide to close the uh, cage, send an image, and give a notification. But even if it isn't, it'll still send a picture and a notification for data logging purposes. So here's a few of our design challenges. Um, it was hard putting these challenges up here because, let's be honest, there were several challenges along the way. These were kind of our three major ones. Uh, one of the major ones was working with the reliable connection. Uh, although seniors set up Wi-Fi on the preserve in past, the, the connection is rather shoddy. So we wanted to do something about this. We wanted to give the user some kind of notifications, allowing them to know if, if they're online, what the upload speed is, and we do this by sharing that over our cloud system and constantly pinging our system. Another challenge was that we wanted to sustain the power of our uh, system for an el elongated period of time. Working with solar power is very fickle and does never add up to the calculations you have. So further, we might want to add a larger solar panel, but this would add to the overall bulkiness of the project. Another large challenge was keeping the processing time down. One of the things we discussed with our customer is that pigs are smart animals and they're not going to be hanging around very long. So we wanted to keep our system under three minutes, which we attained through our tests. Here are some of the important tests that we conducted. We, uh, we've conducted many more, but here are the five most important ones. Uh, first, the motion sensor viewing angle, lighting tests, power efficiency, the TensorFlow accuracy, and the notification and cage door closure. One of the issues was that our PIR motion sensor, which detected infrared motion, it was able to detect any motion within a 120 degree angle, which is too wide, as most cages are usually five by five feet. So in order to 
fix this, we developed a cone, or we created a cone that would limit that viewing angle. And the total viewing angle of the cone ended up being a little under 40 degrees. In order for me to test whether or not this actually worked, I placed the motion sensor seven feet away from me and stood directly in the middle. As you can see in the graph, if I were to move two and a half feet to the left or two and a half feet to the right, it would still be detecting me. So anywhere within that five foot range, I would be detected. However, when I, as soon as I stepped out of that range, I was no longer being detected. And the, I was able to determine that the motion sensor's detection sensitivity was about 85%. And after running this test, we were able to confirm that our PIR motion sensor was able to detect, or, or detection angle was able to be controlled. Uh, so light test. We had to decide what the right amount of LEDs were that wasn't going to affect our confidence rating received from our TensorFlow. Uh, to test this, we set up a camera in a similar fashion that we would have our prototype system set up at about 41 inch height and a six feet out. We took pictures at a 46 degree angle and used different arrays. We learned that around five LEDs are sufficient enough and anything above would be extra. If we were to upscale this, we may want to add more LEDs to that for further con for higher confidence levels. But for the sake of our prototype, five LEDs is perfect. Uh, here's a little power efficiency test. We wanted to test the computing percentage and how it correlates to the current pull of our system. So to do this, we swept the computing percentage from zero to 85%. We saw that as we did that, the current pull went up. And when we are running our TensorFlow software, it sits at about 35%. And while idle, it's at 0%. To be safe, we assumed it's always gonna be at 35% and chose our operating point as such. So 350 milliamp pull for about 12 hours of uh, working time. As we said before, we wanted to eliminate false positives, one through the motion sensor and two through our image recognition software. So we took some images from hunting, from similar hog traps as we mentioned before, and decided to do image analysis on all of them to see what we got. And we chose an image that was unrelated, a coyote, which is commonly found in traps to ensure like it doesn't recognize it as a pig. And our results were a success showing that all five of the four of the pictures were shown as pigs, and the one that wasn't was shown as a coyote. So in this, I ran two separate tests, one to test the notification delay to the user, and then one to test how long it would take for the cage door to be closed. With the first test, the notification delay, I utilized both positive images and negative images. And positive images being defined as me showing our system, a picture of a pig, and then it recognizing that yes, that is a pig, a negative image being defined as I'm showing a different animal and our system not recognizing that as a pig. So with this test, I ran it over a course of 20 trials, randomly distributing each image, and found that the average delay time from when the last motion was detected to when the user received a notification was 44 seconds, give or take a second because I was using a timer and I may have been a little bit too slow or too fast. In the second test, the cage closure test, I did a similar setup where I tested from the last motion detected to when the cage door was closed. However, with this test to ensure that the cage closure was correct, I had to make sure that the cage door actually closed by showing it only positive images. And as you can see, the average time delay was 44.38 seconds with give or take another second. Also, when I ran that notification delay test, I recorded the average times for positive images and negative images and found that the average time for both, when a positive image was analyzed and when a negative image was analyzed, the times were about the same, showing that no matter what was inside the cage, there was no impact on the time delay. So here are the key components that we use for our project. Most importantly, the Raspberry Pi, a PIR motion sensor, a Logitech webcam, and a stainless steel solenoid. And um, uh, the Raspberry Pi has a um, quad-core ARM A53 1.2 gigahertz processor. And the most important thing about these components is that all these can be upscaled for better processing time or better image quality. So here's our schedule. Um, as you can see here, our plan time was much shorter than what it took. Uh, this is something we learned very quickly, and that usually whatever you account for, you, you have to at least multiply by two. 
Uh, one of the larger issues we faced along the way was we originally actually planned on using an Arctic system. However, halfway through our project around December, it was discontinued and all references were taken off the internet. We went into panic mode and had to switch it over, thus you know, showing the fact that everything took a little longer. And that was something that really we learned from. So some of the future work that we would like to do with our system is at adding a GSM module to, for system connectivity in areas without Wi-Fi, as our system runs only in areas that have Wi-Fi connectivity. Another would be scaling it to size, because if you look at our system, it is a little bit smaller because we were not able to get access to a life-size caged or an actual animal. And then we would also like to further weatherproof or waterproof for our system, so that way people can use it for various applications, maybe even underwater animal detection there. And then the last thing that we would like to add is a more in-depth cloud system to analyze animal activity in various regions over time. So to conclude, our experience with this project is that we learned a lot about group dynamic. When someone's working hardware and someone's working software and someone's working in design and casing, it's really hard to get all that together. Uh, and as we discussed before, scheduling, nothing ever goes as planned. But the most interesting part of this project was working with new and emerging technologies such as AI and TensorFlow and IOTs uh, in our UV dots cloud. And another thing is environmental sustainability. When we were able to see the preserve, we learned a lot about the environment. We learned about what's sustainable along with pigs and traps. And so, you know, that was very good for us. And uh, these are a few of our supporting courses. Um, these past four years have been crucial to everything we did this whole project. Um, we just thank everyone for it. And a few references. And then finally, any questions and comments. Thank you again. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Holly. Uh, yeah, just a comment. Um, and this is a credit to you guys. Originally, I know the customer said, well, if the trap is set and it's not a pig, we want you to have a big motor to wind up the trap door and, and step an air horn and get the end out. <laughs> and uh, obviously, a lot less efficient. So it's a credit to you guys that you came up with an alternate solution. And the other comment, I'm hoping you're going to send around links to your web page. Oh, yes, of course. We do have that on the first slide, but uh, we can send that around as well. Okay. Any other? Oh. Joe? Why did you not consider using cell uh, services initially? Why did you go for Wi-Fi? Um, initially, when we were moving along the project, we wanted to make sure that we could get that connection up first. Um, as you know, GSMs are a little difficult to work with. So we set up our, our, our Wi-Fi reliability, worked along the project, you know, made sure everything was going. And as we wound down, we realized it just wasn't really in the scope of the project, but would be a, something that would be extremely crucial to the overall prototype system, for sure. How does uh, TensorFlow work with multiple pigs in the image, or like multiple uh, images, or multiple bodies within the same image? So um, the way TensorFlow works is it outputs the top five results uh, like of what it believes it could be. So if there's multiple pigs in an image, I it should show it as one of the results. And the way our software works is that if it has any kind of like confidence that there's a pig in the image, it'll close. It's very like, yeah. TensorFlow looks for uh, details in something. So it just finds that common detail it knows that, that, that's been taught and learned, and it is able to identify those details in each one. Are you all able to uh, test the system on uh, a live animal? No, unfortunately we weren't. Uh, live animal testing is a little frowned upon. Uh, a lot of hoops to jump through, and this wasn't really, as it was winding down, hard to do. Okay. And did you have to provide uh, a data set yourself, or was it built in? Uh, so we kind of, uh, a little of both. Yeah. Sure. I used the um, library that comes with TensorFlow. I used Inception V3 by, um, yeah, and it comes with that um, animal library is preloaded, so we actually didn't use our own library. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. We appreciate it.
Chris Brown? No idea. Huh? Where's Brandon? Where is he? There he is. Hi everyone, how is everyone doing? I'm Jairo Alberto. I'm Nicholas Vani. I'm Brandon Barron. We're Trout Lab. First of all, we want to thank our clients from Redwood Empire Trout Unlimited, our industry advisor, Tom Greer, and our academic advisor, Dr. Ali Kajiri. So here's our overview of our whole presentation. I'll start by talking about the problem. So the problem we're trying to solve is that our cu customers from Trout Unlimited provide trout eggs for a program called Steelhead in the Classroom, but they have no way to monitor the development and growth of those eggs. So in 2019, over 40 classrooms signed up to be a part of the Steelhead in the Classroom program. Um, the reason why our device is so important is because in this program, the children and students, or students and teachers, sorry, get the trout eggs, grow them, hatch them, and then release them into the wild. So it's important that a large number of trout get released into the wild because they're becoming an endangered species in California right now. So it's important that we start bringing up the number of trout in the population and it's important that we monitor these conditions so that that's a successful process. Okay, so ex some existing solutions in the market, we have Cyanide Reef. They measure some of the same things we do, but they do not measure ORP. They don't contain a camera and it's a wired connection. We also have Fishbit. They have a smart controller and a, an app to um, view the data of their sensors, but they only measure temperature and light and have no camera. Finally, we have Neptune system. It's very expensive, has no camera, and is also a wired connection. So this brings us to our proposal. Our proposal is a device that monitors the light, temperature, and ORP within a fish tank at uh, set intervals. It'll then send that information wirelessly to a website. Uh, and if the website has certain commands enabled on it, it'll perform those actions when the website sends those requests. So ORP is a value that we've mentioned a couple times now and haven't explained. So what it stands for is oxidation reduction potential, and to put simply, it's basically the measure of the water's quality. So on our ORP sensor, there are two conductive plates, and they pick up the amount of electrons passing through them in the water. Um, what it, how it picks up the amount of electrons is the comparison of reducers and oxidizers in the water. So a common reducer in a tank is fish waste, the particles of food, and just the particles on the fish body that get released. So reducers, they strip electrons away from other molecules in the body of water, and oxidizers provide more electrons in that body of water. So if there are more reducers in the water, i.e. fish food, uh, fish waste and just the particles from the body, the water is more dirty because the solution has more reducers and less electrons, so the ORP value drops because of that. And if there's more oxidizers in the body of water, the amount of electrons rises and the reading from the ORP rises as well, and it's measured in millivolts. Uh, that brings us to our marketing and engineering requirements. With these uh, sets in mind, we developed our marketing requirements on the left. Uh, the first one, first couple being measuring of temperature, ORP, and light. Our third being that uh, most of the time this tank will be in an entirely closed off case. Therefore, there won't be any light. We'd have to have some sort of IR light source within the tank to not scare the fish. And our fifth one here being SMS notifications in case any variables go outside of their thresholds. Uh, should we? Our engineering requirements are based on such with the threshold values that our trout are supposed to live in being a 55 degree water temperature, give or take five, and then ORP from negative 165 millivolts to 205 millivolts. Here's our whole system overview of our project. We have our three sensors and camera connected to our Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, the ORP sensor is connected to an I squared C port, the temperature is connected to 
a G-Power port, and our camera connected to the camera cable, all being powered by a 5-volt pin. Our Raspberry Pi is powered through a 120-volt outlet, which is down converted to 5 volts. And another 5-volt pin is powering our smart switch, which is connected through a G-Power port also. Our smart switch contains a two-channel relay with a maximum DC output of 20 volts and 10 amps. All of our data is then sent and video sent through a, our MySQL server slash database using post and get quest to our Trout Lab website, PHP Designed. And from the website, you can view all of our data and videos. And from there, they can control our smart switch, plug in whatever they would like. And if our, any of our sensor values reaches above or below a certain threshold value, a Twilio skip is written to alert the user of those variables. This is our hardware, over, hardware, uh, hardware overview. Uh, once the device is powered on, it'll connect to the local Wi-Fi source that it's been pre-enabled for. From there, it'll start calculating sensors, or start testing the sensors and taking values, sending those off to the website. If any of those values are above or below our threshold, it'll alert the user via SMS, as stated before. And then afterwards, it'll ping the website asking for information about the smart switches and whether or not the user wants a new video. It'll then perform those actions and wait until the next set of uh, sensor values are to be taken. This is our website overview and how our web system works. As the server is spun up, it starts waiting for the data to come in from any given user. Uh, once data hits the server with the correct API token, it'll then sort this value uh, by their user into the sensor data, into our sensor data table. <coughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. Once it hits the server, uh, the server will then send back the, the smart switch and new video request information. If the system sends back a new video, it'll clear out the old video, Say, resave the new video as well as update the pointer in the database to the new video so when the user logs in they can see all their new data and videos. Okay, so we conducted tests based on some of our engineering requirements. We've tested our ORP calibration accuracy, ORP versus the pH level, temperature accuracy, two-way communication through our smart switch and the camera light sensor. Each test was conducted 10 times and were complete. So like Jaira said, our first test was our ORP calibration and accuracy test. So how we tested this was we used a provided 225 millivolt calibration solution that came with our sensor, which had a plus or minus 0.02 millivolts, or yeah, plus, so plus or minus 0.02 millivolt reading. Um, so we put our ORP sensor in there to make sure that we were getting accurate readings, and we came to a conclusion that our we had a max error of 1.51% and an average error of 0.67%. So we exceeded our goal of being within five millivolts. Our next test was ORP versus pH. Um, the reason why we conducted this test was to give teachers and students another variable to potentially uh, measure when these are implemented in the classrooms. And this was one of the original um, variables they wanted to measure, but they changed to ORP. So the way we tested this was we had a list of variable solutions here that have standard pH values. We tested them with pH litmus paper to make sure that they were at those pH values. And then we used our ORP sensor to compare the values of pH to the ORP readings. We found a scale uh, between pH and ORP. There is a correlation that for every pH value, increase or decrease, there is an increase or decrease of 59 millivolts on the ORP scale. So we measured and it found, we found that there is a correlation between them and it matched our table very closely. The reason why this happens is because, like I mentioned before, oxidizers and reducers affect the level of ORP. And if you view pH as a measure of hydrogen ions, which are uh, the most common oxidizers in water, um, you can see that there's a correlation. So as pH goes down, there's more hydrogen ions present, therefore increasing the ORP level. And as pH rises, the amount of hydrogen ions and oxidizers decrease, therefore decreasing the ORP level. Our next test connected was the temperature accuracy test. We wanted to test the, our accuracy of our waterproof temperature sensor that's attached to our Raspberry Pi. 
and we compared those values to a multimeter and a mercury thermometer. The goal was to be accurate within one degree Fahrenheit, and in conclusion, we were able to get a max accuracy, error accuracy of negative 0.6 percent, and compared to the thermometer, and a positive 2.12 percent compared to the multimeter. Uh, for two-way web communication, which is important for controlling our smart switch and making this tank semi or fully autonomous, uh, we set up our websites to uh, set up a web page that would pull from our switch data table on our database, and it would send a JSON argument or JSON when hit. When this JSON is hit, you can view it actually right up there. Uh, it'll change in corresponding to those switch value you can see there from our website, and with that we could control the smart switch on the tank, varying temperature through indirectly through a chiller and or heater, or anything else the user wishes to plug in. Our final test was a camera light sensor test. Originally we were using an analog light sensor, which needed an analog to digital converter add-on to our Raspberry Pi to so to con I mean to lessen our cost and reduce our size we decided to use our camera to kill two birds with one stone. And we used the shutter speed, which measures fractions of light per second, microsecond, to determine the, the light in our tank. And we compared those values to a lux meter. And to convert that to lumens, you would just simply convert, multiply the lux by the area, surface area of our tank. And in conclusion, we were able to prove that this shutter speed could be used to detect the light in our tank. Uh, some of the problems we faced were storage. There's upwards of 40 tanks in this county alone that are using the, that will have the potential to use this system, which means there's going to be a lot of data. So we ended up sitting around with an industry standard database called MySQL. Uh, the other issue is sending video. There's lots of different methods that you can use to send video, but we couldn't verify whether or not certain schools would have some of those ports open on their routing system. As such, we settled using HTTPS uh, to send our video in a multi-part body. So another challenge we faced was waterproofing. So our ORP sensor and temperature sensor came waterproof already, but we needed to measure the light intensity in the tank as well. We were worried about waterproofing the sensor that Jaira previously mentioned, and that was another reason why we switched to using the camera shutter speed to detect the light, because we already had our camera in a waterproof case, and it was watertight. So that was the third reason as to why we uh, switched to that camera, and we didn't have to face waterproofing a third sensor. We also had to understand ORP as it was one of the variables that our customers wanted to be measured. We had no prior experience with it, so it was difficult to understand it to measure accurately and properly, but eventually we got it down. Here's our full schedule. We divided it equally into three different parts, Nick being in charge of the web end of the project, I'm even in charge of the firmware and Brandon being in charge of the hardware. So we could consistently be working on this project and we were able to stay ahead, as you can see in our schedule. So here's our estimated budget. Uh, we came out to just under $1,000 for our whole device um, development. That was to make three devices. Two have been sent out already to be tested in the Trout Unlimited um, lab and also in one of the classrooms in the area. Uh, the third one we have right here that we can show you after the presentation. Uh, the price per unit came out to $343, which was about $100 under our cheapest competitor. So here's a visual of fi our final implementation. It includes our camera inside our waterproof casing, ORP sensor, and temperature sensor. And to the right of that is our Trout Lab smart switch that could be user interface through our Trout Lab website. Here is our website and phone interfaces. On the left, you'll see our website, and scrolling through it, you'll see our video. And you can also, if it'll scroll down, is it? Yeah. yeah. As you see it scroll down, you'll see graphs of both temp of temperature, ORP, and light. Uh, these are all updated every time it's hit, every time our site is hit by our device. On the right, you'll see live uh, live updates from our Twilio account about our tank's values. So some future works we want to include to our device. So we want to cut the cost to under $100 less. We want to implement student sign-ins, uh, backup power supply in case the power goes up in the classroom. And we also want to monitor other parameters of other wildlife in the aquatic livestock. 
So here are our references, and we're open to any questions and comments the audience has right now. Unexpected issues. Um, one funny issue was when we were making the board, we were looking at the pins upside down. So once we soldered everything, the whole thing crashed. So we had to unsolder everything and solder back together. <laughs> We've all done that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, our most expensive sensor was the ORP sensor, costing at $192 for one. Um, so I guess the easiest way to do that would be finding cheaper sensors. Um, our temperature sensor was also $50. So that would probably be, be the first go-to solution to lowering the price. Um, everything else is pretty consistent, and we got it as low as we could. You said uh, two were out of the already? Yes. Have you received any feedback? Uh, as of now, we have not. One is still being tested by the Trout Lab team, or by the Trout Unlimited team, and the other we have not heard any feedback yet from our industry advisor about. So, does the smart switch typically get used for heater or chiller or some purpose like that? It's up to the customer to decide how they want to do that. Yeah, yes. it's up to, really up to the customer. They can plug control temperature by uh, plugging in a temperature heater. Water chiller, they can even even plug in an automatic fish heater. I mean feeder, if they're going on vacation too. Did they talk to you about some kind of control system where they want it to a certain range and then they use the switching to control keeps the tank at a certain temperature? Most of the correspondence we had did not indicate anything in that direction. Our original design was to use just a relay going into the chiller so they could turn it on or off, but. Um, someone brought up the point of if it was in a very cold area, let's say Minnesota in the winter, that's what they said, um, the, what if they needed a heater because the water would get too low. So that's why we implemented a smart switch so that they could plug any variable in there to keep the water at the conditions that they need. Uh, first off, I think you guys did a great job. Uh, but I was curious, with the data you saw, the ORP, so that music can intervene if things aren't really good, like pH level or like oxygen level? Right, so all of the variables that we give, we're not, um, they're all just there so that they can constantly monitor it so that if they need to change anything in the tank, they can go and see when it happened because it's all time stamped and then figure out what caused that so that they can re prevent that from happening in the future so that the trout eggs develop in the perfect ideal conditions. If you guys have more time, what other features would you add to this? Hmm. <laughs> We would probably add increased ability to pair with routers. Right now, it requires a fair amount of user setup. But if we could find an easier way to pair with routers directly, it would severely reduce the time that the user has to set it up. Yes. So how did you do the Um, so the sensors, it's the ORP sensor and temperature sensor, they were already waterproof, so we didn't have to worry about those. But the camera, um, we're using a very thin ribbon cable that connects to our Raspberry Pi. And we placed it over the opening of the case, and then once we screw it down, we put Vaseline over it so it makes it watertight. That was a suggestion that we got from our advisor, and it proved to work. So we just had to make sure we had a waterproof case that was definitely watertight so that no water could seep through where the ribbon cable was accessed. Yes. And uh, why did the camera need to lay inside the tank? Uh, would, it, would it be possible to put it outside and look through the window? We did test that and um, the refraction, because it's an infrared light camera, so there's a lot of light uh, refracting through the glass of the tank, so it, a lot of it would spill into the lens and cause a lot of glare. So. This was our best solution that we found. And we made a camera mount inside of the case that we can show you later. It uh, has a sort of a cylindrical shield around the lens so that no light can spill in. And it's right up against the acrylic on the case. Uh, what was the importance of the light? Why was that an important variable? 
So for trout egg to develop uh, properly, um, they have to be in dark conditions. There's been a lot of tests uh, done on that. So if they're exposed to light too long in their early stages, they can hatch with a lot of deformities and then not live long once they're fully developed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of lights, um, like indoor lights, that don't necessarily generate a lot of IR light, but um, would they also be affected by sort of the other spectrum of the visible wavelength if you're only detecting IR light versus um, things more in the visible spectrum? Right. So it's actually detecting all light. Um, our IR lights are just for the camera so that they can see in the dark conditions. Oh, you have IR lights inside. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hi. We are the Bucky Liner Group. We are a soccer field uh, relining solution. My name is Sean. My name is Hal. And I'm John. Our advisors for this project were Dr. Uh, Don Estrich and Dr. Sarah Urkasis, as well as Joe Stevenson and Daniel Cliff. Um, our uh, client for this project was Anoma, uh, Sonoma Sound County Adult Soccer League. Uh, this is an overview of our presentation. We start from the problem, existing works, and, and, and the proposal of our project. And then, and, and then we talk about the system overview and project requirements for bucket liner, the challenges that we face, the test and the result of this test, the um, cost of components, the project milestone that what we did each time, the future works, and the supporting causes. So our customer, Sonoma County Adult Soccer League, is seen here in action. They have 17 weeks of play. Following the initial lining, the subsequent 16 weeks will be followed by our line detecting robot. We'll see the existing line and follow that line, applying new paint on top. Seen below is the current method. We believe this is right for disruption, as human error compounds which each additional lining or whoever looks to mitigate this. Uh, here are the exciting works that we found. The first one is Tofu Tank. It is very expensive, about $35,000. Um, and it is very hard to use because it is very heavy and it should use the uh, special paint. Also, the GPS contract is uh, required for Tofu Tank. And the, third, uh, and the second one is uh, Pitch Air. It is designed by Nissan. It is a very smart uh, robot that can paint the whole field by itself. But it, it is not for sale right now. So here we have our proposed solution. Like we said, we look to automate this process by pulling the existing line with our camera. Seen here. As a customer requirement, we need to use existing paint cans that are accessible to our customer so they can supply the paint themselves using universal paint cans. Also, this needs to be intuitive. So if anyone can set up this rover at its origin, follow the LCD prompt here, and initiate with a start button here. So this is our system overview. Um, as you can see, it starts out by detecting the old line with uh, a camera unit. And that camera unit gives feedback back to the rover, and that, then the rover follows the line uh, using that feedback, uh, controlling each individual motor. Um, it's got a user interface with an LCD display and a start button. 
Um, this is what helps the uh, user begin the process of relining, as well as before that, there's a calibration process that the rover needs to go through so that we can keep track of where its position is, as well as know its uh, current velocity to uh, consistently repaint the field. Great, thanks for that, Sean. Now we're going to talk about a hardware system. If I could draw your attention to the legend on top, we've broken out our voltages, our communication protocols, and finally, coupling the rotary encoders to the motors was a challenge. So to address that, we printed a 3D planetary gear set to couple the rotary encoders with the inside of the wheel as we do not have access to the motor shaft itself. Seen here. So let's start with charging. This block charges our battery, it's a 36 volt battery. When this switch is closed, O-Drive is able to power up, powering these two brushless DC motors, encoded, seen here. Our Raspberry Pi does the computational power and uh, calculations for uh, our O-Drive, and also controls a secondary uh, microcontroller uh, in a uh, slave configuration. Uh, in order to pull up on a spray cable. This is a linear actuator for translational uh, uh, displacement in the Z direction. Um, and we have uh, hard limit switches to limit our travel. Uh, and importantly, we have uh, regulators, 12 volts to run our linear actuator and five volts to run both the Raspberry Pi and microcontroller unit. Uh, here's our software design. Uh, we start out by the user turning the rover on, and then the, it actually waits uh, for the user to press the button again. This way, um, it doesn't start doing anything without um, the customer being ready for it. Uh, after uh, they press the button, uh, it starts up, uh, checks the O-Drive is actually functioning, and then it goes through a calibration process so the encoders are properly functioning uh, for the previously mentioned position tracking and velocity control. Um, after that, it waits again, uh, and it displays the current line position so that the user can do any final line adju adjustments of the rover so that when they start it, it can start as smoothly as possible. Um, once they press the button again, it goes into the entire relining process where it will follow the line, and while it's following the line, it, it re uh, repaints uh, the old line. Uh, once it is uh, at a turn point, um, which it uh, intuitively knows as well as the text, um, it checks to see if it is a final turn. This is because um, we are doing only right turns with this rover and we're going to do a total of 32 right turns. And once it reaches that 30 second uh, turn, it knows that it's actually at back to its point of origin, therefore it is done and it finishes. Um, but if it is not done, then it just goes through its turning algorithm uh, where it turns right hand uh, 90 degrees and <coughs> continues following the line from there. Uh, here, uh, here are the product requirements for our project. Uh, for our project, the customer give us the marketing requirements, and the marketing requirements give us the engineering requirements. And here are some important requirements for us. The first one is buggy can go straight and paint the straight line. The engineering requirement for this one is um, the deviation of the line that buggy paint cannot more than five centimeter. And the second one is buggy can detect the line and uh, turns uh, cons um, consistently. Uh, the engineering requirement for this is uh, our camera can detect the line and uh, uh, and turns accuracy. And the third one is buggy can paint the whole field without charging. And our uh, engineering requirement for this one is we use 158 was battery, it is enough for Bucky to paint the whole field without charging. These are some of the challenges that we faced initially when uh, going through our design process. First and foremost, we needed the rover to be able to maintain a constant velocity and keep track of its position. Um, we did this uh, in the end by using some enco encoders coupled uh, onto the wheels so that we can keep track of all of these things. Uh, second, being able to dissect and then follow the line. Um, without this, uh, we would be uh, driving blind and we would have lines in places that we didn't want them to be. Uh, third, being able to turn 90 degrees uh, uh, both accurately and consistently was very important. Um, otherwise, we would have corners that were a little bit uh, messed up. 
And third, uh, a somewhat smaller challenge, but we, start, uh, we started with a two-wheeled rover. And this uh, rover was very good with its turning radius. However, it was not stable and the line spray would not be very good. So we uh, combated that by adding a third wheel behind it. Um, this wheel is free spinning, so it, it maintains the very tight turning radius that we need for it, but gives us the stability that we need. Uh, so here's uh, some of the tests that we tried uh, before we got to the final product. Uh, initially, uh, to detect the uh, line, we were trying to use some IR sensors. However, we quickly realized that outside, these IR sensors were completely washed out by sunlight. Um, so we tried to use some uh, sunlight filtering IR sensors to combat that. However, we quickly also realized that uh, these were washed out by sunlight. Um, so uh, another thing that we did try initially uh, was a GPS. Uh, this was to keep track of the rover's posi position. However, we pivoted away from that because it would take too much time to get it up and running as well as there were accuracy problems with how uh, the, the position of the rover versus its actual position. Um, this is one of our calculation, the right-hand calculation. As we know, uh, the turning is very important uh, for our project, and we should know first the circumference of wheel is about uh, 75 centimeter, and then the one wheel revolution is equal to 16,000 uh, 16, in total cost per revolution. And uh, there are uh, three steps totally uh, at the bottom. The first one is when bucket cannot detect the line, it go forward about 40, uh, 40.5 centimeter. Um, uh, and yeah, and the um, uh, second part is like uh, just uh, stay, he stay here. And the uh, third part is the left wheel of the bucky not move, and the right wheel of the bucky uh, move clockwise 90 degrees. Uh, the distance of the right wheel moving is about 79.1 uh, centimeter. Uh, after calculation, it is about uh, like uh, 17,000 in total counts. And after step three, the right turn is done. Another test that we conducted was actually testing the camera and its image processing capabilities. Uh, this test here, we're describing uh, a test that was done where we held the camera at uh, set heights uh, ranging from centimeter, uh, 10 centimeters all the way up to uh, one meter high. Uh, we found that uh, the closer it was to the line, the worse the quality was. Um, and that was consistent all the way out to our maximum range of one meter. Um, However, there are uh, some hardware limitations that we ran into. We can't build uh, a, a rig to hold the camera consistently at that height. So we found that uh, around 40 centimeters was uh, an optimal compromise between our hardware limitations while ma uh, maintaining the highest line accuracy that we could. And for actually following the line, we use something called linear regression. We're using a ro robust version of that. Uh, how that works is it uh, isolates the line uh, by a threshold that we set, uh, turning our image into a binary image where there's just black pixels for the line and everything else turns white. Um, then it calculates the uh, slope between all the individual uh, paired pixels and it finds the median slope of all of that. And once we have that, we have a predicted line position. Um, after we get that predicted line position, we calculate it, the angle that that line is relative to the camera's position, where if it is perpendicular 90 degrees, we are on track. Otherwise, if it is uh, greater than or less than 90 degrees, we know that it is uh, deviated a little bit. And then we use that to calculate um, our error by subtracting the ideal uh, angle, and we control our motors uh, proportionally to smoothly follow the line. So as Hal mentioned earlier, our customer requirements drove our engineering requirements. For this requirement, we wanted to ensure that our customer could complete one field and not run out of power while straining. So we classified our loads here, and we have a 36-volt battery. And so we concluded that one, one field takes 90 seconds to spray total. So our, our rover can supply uh, over 90 minutes. Uh, under a full load, including all our subsystems. Uh, here are our budget and, compo and co components. 
Some of the important components for our project are LCD, O-Drive 2, and camera. And the total cost of our project is about $720. Here's some of the project milestones that we came across, uh, ran into along the way. Um, initially, uh, early December, we actually did some testing with a, uh, our camera, and we, it was a great proof of concept that we got the image processing uh, working and detecting the line. Uh, second, getting the motor controller and encoders uh, up and running was very critical. Uh, we got that done uh, at a good time, too, so that we could uh, smoothly follow the line and not deviate too much, uh, keeping a straight line. Uh, third, I'd like to point out that we finally achieved full system integration uh, in the middle of April, um, so just in time for this. So for future works, we have a few things we'd like to implement. So far, we follow the existing line, but we'd like to have an algorithm set up so we can do shapes, like a rectangle for a soccer field, or perhaps a uh, different field, football, etc. cetera. Uh, installing a paint reservoir for a maximum amount of paint is necessary for our rover to be tr truly autonomous, to where it can live in a docking station on the field, charge up during the week, and go about its scheduled routine, truly being autonomous. And this is our supporting courses. Uh, references. And thanks for everybody who helped with us. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi, in the back, yes. Oh. Oh. Who? Yeah, go, go ahead, yes. How many fields have you painted? Uh, that's a great question. We have actually not painted any full fields yet. Uh, most of our testing has been done indoors with our artificial turf that is over there. That's a, much, a future work kind of thing. Yeah, sorry. Yes? Uh, do you have any way to detect if uh, you lost traction? Uh, aren't moving? Right, so say you hit a wet spot in the field and the wheel's sitting there spinning, the motor's moving. Oh. Um, actually, no, we do not. Great um, question. It's a great question. Uh, one thing to keep into note, uh, keep account of is uh, we won't be painting the fields while uh, there's any rain or that it is wet. The paint is water soluble, and it just won't adhere to the the grass very well. So hopefully, that's not a condition we come up to, in, in contact with. Do you run into any particular challenges with the control system to keep it steering without oscillating or uh, yes, we did. Um, initially, we had hard limits where if it was deviated by just uh, one degree, um, it, 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 it was one, uh, one change uh, depending, it didn't matter if it was one degree deviation or 10 degree de deviation. Um, so we fixed that uh, by setting up a, an error calculation and then using proportional control. So that if it's, if it's uh, one degree off, it, it changes much less drastically. Hi, good morning. I think you had a question. Yes, there would uh, need to be uh, uh, different uh, scripts for a different size field. Theoretically, we could do any size field, uh, but it, it's much better to have those uh, numbers put in. Um, that's something that we might want to have on a user interface, so there would be at least a selection. Uh, you, yeah. Um, it will continue. Uh, right now, we don't have that uh, put in. But uh, what, what would we? What, what we essentially would do was just continue on, assuming uh, that the line's uh, somewhere in the distance, um, because uh, that's that's why we keep track of the position uh, the position that the wheel is, so that we know how far it's traveled. Um, and after a certain point, it would just stop.
Uh, it's a great question. We uh, conducted simulations in Python. There's a function, as you might know, called turtle. And that helps us uh, simulate with actually, not actually spraying paint yet. So we uh, went through many revisions of that. But we believe this project is so ripe for machine learning, you know, to where it can actually go define the line itself, you know, wander around for a set period of time and collect its own data, building its data set. So that's one direction we'd like to pivot in the future. Would the system work at night under the light of, you know, the stadium light, or uh, in the dark? Under uh, stadium light? Uh, so, we don't actually have any lights on it, um, so it wouldn't work in complete darkness. However, under stadium light, I believe that it may work. Um, one future thing that we might want to consider putting in is uh, its own light so that it could, but yes, it could function uh, in the dark if it had its own lighting system. Sure, yeah. Um, I was curious, you guys said that you have 40 centimeters of Uh, yeah, we did lose a little accuracy by being lower. Um, the closer that you are, uh, the camera is to the uh, grass, the more grainy the picture is, and the binary image uh, reflects that. Um, however, uh, at 40 centimeters, we can accurately enough detect it, and with the proportional control, it, it will follow the line pretty smoothly. Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, the average soccer line is about the width of your hand. So we use that as a plus or minus gauge, and that's a FIFA requirement. But uh, there's quite a bit of latitude in that uh, lining dimension to where it could be between one and two hands wide. Good question. Yes. Hi, Chris. So uh, I have one simple question for you guys. So for all the uh, juniors sitting in the audience in the back that are going to be starting this project of their own in a few months, what advice would you give? Yes, start early and trust your test. Your, 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 tr your test will guide you. You know, a lot of our hardware pivots, we tried lots of different hardware implementations, and really our test gave us uh, empirical data that we could build upon and be confident going forward with. So uh, thank you for asking that question. All right. Thank you. Jump drive? Yeah, I got it. Too. Okay. How do you do that? You just, uh, just launch it. Spark agent. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's there. And if you Did oops. you change it to mirroring? Oh, no, you just hit present. So if you look up there, it's got the actual thing. Perfect. Thank you. Nice job. <laughs> Empty room. Oh, yes. oh, there's a laser. Oh, yes. Is this a laser? Oh. I'm going to wait for it to calm down. They're scared. Because we're too good. <laughs> They're, uh, they think it's the break. No. So we've taken a break a little early. All right, we're just going to start. Hello, everybody. I'm Craig McGovern. I'm Rio Smith. And I'm Carter O'Neill. And with the help of our advisors, Dr. Sadir Shrestha and Wei Zhao, we are Smart Gauge Reader. This is a brief slide going over what we're going to be talking about during this presentation. We're going to start with the problem and our solution, move on to our hardware and software design, then go into our marketing and engineering requirements, our bill of materials, the tests we conducted, and those results, and finally end with some challenges, future works, and our experience. So let's start with the problem. Many manufacturing facilities are still using analog dials to read data such as pressure, temperature, and humidity. These dials must be checked periodically that the system is operating at optimum capacity. This is extremely inefficient and time consuming, raising production costs which must be passed down to the end users. As Carter was saying, one of the current solutions to this problem is having people walk around with clipboards. 
it's inefficient, and if the person's not standing at the dial when the spike happens, they won't see it happening. One of the other solutions on the other end is completely converting the factory over to a smart factory. However, this renders all existing equipment useless and can be quite expensive. In the middle, there are two other solutions, one of which is Modius Open Data. It's a small Linux box that takes temperature and humidity measurements in an effort to improve data center operations. However, this only measures factors inside a room such as this, not necessarily inside a, or inside a vat or inside a container. The other solution out there is a dial reader open ZV program. However, this isn't accurate, it's not automated, it's not connected to the cloud, and it has a long calibration process. Our solution is a retrofit solution that turns an analog dial into digital data, which can then be viewed by an operator by any of their devices, whether that be a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer. There are three main stages of the smart gauge reader, the first of which is the camera unit. The heart of the camera unit is a Raspberry Pi 3. Connected to this microcontroller, we also have a Raspberry Pi camera and a string of LEDs used to control the lighting environment. The camera unit will take a picture of an existing dial every second, and once that image is taken, it will be sent to our gateway unit via a Wi-Fi connection. The gateway unit consists of a Samsung Arctic 710 microcontroller. Its role is basically to turn that analog picture of the dial into digital data. It then checks to see if that data point is within a normal range for the dial, and then it sends it along via Wi-Fi connection to our cloud storage system. Once it arrives in our cloud system, it shows up in Amazon Web Services IoT. This is their Internet of Things protocol. So you can connect microcontrollers into Amazon Web Services. From there, these messages are published to Elasticsearch, where they can be viewed on a Kibana dashboard, which shows a live graph to the end user. This is an overview of the software design that takes place within our gateway unit that turns that analog picture into digital data. Basically what happens is this. An image is received of the dial. It's then processed and turned into a binary array as shown up there in the second picture. A circle and a line is found using OpenCV. That point where the line hits the circle corresponds to an actual value of the dial. It's checked to see if it's within a predetermined normal range for the dial and then it sends it along to Amazon Web Services. If it's not within the range, it'll send a text alert to the user. This has to be done after a calibration process, which is pretty quick. Basically what happens is, is you have to calculate the distance away from the, cam from the dial the camera unit has to be that's using our website, which we'll talk about later. You then take a calibration image and you determine the limits of the dial. So basically the degrees of a circle show up on it and you pick which is the lowest angle and the highest angle and also what is the lowest point and the highest point. After that, the system is calibrated and it will work on that dial. When we began this project, we set a series of marketing and engineering requirements and these are a few of our most important. Number one. The system must have an accurate dial reading after calibration. Number two, the system must gather data in a timely manner. Number three, the user will be able to see data analytics of long-term operation. And finally, the system will be able to be implemented in most factory environments. Our bill of materials mainly consists of the products used in the development of our system. We have our two microcontrollers, the Arctic 710 and the Raspberry Pi 3. We then have the camera we use, the Raspberry Pi 3 camera, and our mounting system and case tools along with diffusion LEDs and nuts and bolts that hold our whole system together. The cost of our system that will be passed on to our end user is shown on the right here. Yes, right. Um, our camera unit will be $90. This consists of the case, the Raspberry Pi, the camera, and the LEDs. The gateway unit will be $300. This consists of the case and the Arctic 710. Even though the Arctic 710 is on the more expensive side of things, it has a fast processing power and is incredibly powerful so it can keep up with our time requirements. Our Amazon cost is estimated to be about $50 per month. This is depending on how many gateway units you have. Our system is also expandable, so you can have up to, um, based on preliminary testing, up to five camera units per gateway unit. So now we're going to talk about some tests we've conducted over the past two semesters. And we're going to start with our arc degree error test, which is basically how accurately can we actually read a dial. So for this, what we did was we took 100 images of a dial. We then manually inputted what the value that observed was and then ran it through our system and calculated the error. What we wanted was for there to be 80% of the points within plus or minus um, one arc degree, which is like one degree of a circle, and 90% plus or minus two arc degrees, so two degrees of a circle. When we ran this test first, you can see the red line was the number of arc degrees off that we had for those 100 images. That was done in December. And uh, the blue one, the blue graph, is our more recent uh, run through, which had 82% of the data within plus or minus one degree and 93% of data within plus or minus two degrees. 
Another test that we conducted to, in order to pick which camera we were going to use was a resolution test. For this, basically, we took five images and crushed it to four different size. We wanted to see if we could use a lower quality camera that was cheaper. What we discovered was that we needed to use high resolution images in order to keep our error rate low, which was our main uh, requirement. One of the requirements we set early on was that the ability that the system to gain gather data in a timely manner. What this really meant was the camera unit. So what we did was we set the camera unit up and timed how long it took for each picture to take. We realized there's some human error involved in the timing process, but with a sample size of 50, we feel like we come up with an accurate average of about one second, falling well below our engineering requirement of five seconds. Next test we conducted was a distance test to determine just how far away the camera unit would need to be from an existing dial. So we set up the camera unit at an interval between five centimeters and 15 centimeters and took 10 images at each one of those intervals. Based on this testing, we concluded that for every one centimeter of dial diameter, the camera unit needed to be 1.23 centimeters away from that dial. This calculation is also available on our website so that users will be able to see exactly how far away their camera unit would need to be from their dial. Accuracy is an important part of our system, and in hand with that is the lighting on the dial face. To conduct this test, we took four LED arrays, one with two, four, six, and eight LEDs. Of each LED array, we took 20 sample images and then calculated the average percent error for those images. When we ran our test, we discovered that two LEDs provided us with the lowest percent error for those images. We also determined that was because the more LEDs we added on the face actually caused more glare, making the images less readable. The next test we conducted was more of a functionality test to determine whether or not we'd be able to graph data on Amazon Web Services and allow the user to be able to see it. To do this, we started with IoT, you can, or AWS IoT. You can publish messages from an MQTT command from a microcontroller into IoT where it then goes into a topic. From there, you can publish those into Elasticsearch with an Amazon Web Services rule. And then Kibana, <coughs> which is attached to the Elasticsearch service, can then show the graph to an end user. The graph can see any granularity of time, so you can see the last 10 minutes, two years, or at any day over any period of time. The next test we want to talk about was a three dial test. Basically, we wanted to see if we could read different uh, styles of dials as long as they were circular with one needle. needle. To do this, we took 20 images of each of the three dials shown. We then ran it through our calibration system and calculated the arc degree error. What we determined was that we actually fell within our engineering requirements for these so that we were able to read different types of dials. Once our entire system was complete, it was important to see if the whole thing was going to run. We conducted a 24-hour test to see if we'd meet our marketing requirement of having this be a set-and-go solution. When we conducted this test, we were able to determine that it does run for 24 hours without any errors in the code, and it can run for 24 hours within our error band. There is one spike on our graph, as you can see on the left. The way we had our dial positioned, it was directly in front of a window, and as the sun set, it came through and shown on the dial face. Knowing this, we can then go to customers and see where their windows and where the sun will be in order to prevent this from happening at their factories. Over the course of this project, we encountered many different challenges, the first of which came with our original choice of microcontroller for the camera unit. Originally, we wanted to stick with a fully Arctic system and use an Arctic 055 microcontroller. Unfortunately, this microcontroller limited our choices of camera options and in so our resolution. The image at the top you can see is quite grainy and not great which is part of the reason that our error results were so off in December, as Craig mentioned earlier. The next problem were uh, issues we faced with the actual image reading code inside the gateway unit. Basically, in the beginning, we had a lot of trouble finding the correct circles and lines, especially against non-just pure white backgrounds. Uh, basically, we spent the past two semesters making it better so that we could actually find the correct dial and the line. We encountered some problems with Amazon Web Services. One of the main problems was trying to figure out which program to use. They have so many different options. We originally decided to use QuickSight, which allows the user to have a very nice dashboard. But upon our first 24-hour test, we discovered you can only upload 1,000 CSV files into QuickSight, and we were uploading about 14,000 a day. So we did more research, as always, and Upon that, we discovered that you can use Elasticsearch and Kibana. Even though you do have to sacrifice some of the analytics you get from QuickSight, it allows there to be a live graph that updates in about 20 seconds from the end user. The other problem we had was using the Amazon Web, Web Services command line interface commands, not in terminal, but instead in the Python code we were running. We were able to find a program called Voto, which allowed us to convert those commands and update our data into AWS. 
Some, for, some future works we'd like to add to this project, the first would be a camera unit interface. Currently, it takes a little bit of finessing to ensure that the camera unit is fully encapsulating the dial. If we had a live video feed showing what the camera was capturing in real time, this would greatly increase this process. We'd also like to do some more testing with multiple camera units. Currently, we know it is possible to graph multiple camera unit data on one gateway unit, but we'd like to do some more testing to determine exactly how much bandwidth usage would be required. And finally, we'd like to add automatic calibration. As Craig mentioned earlier, it takes between one and five minutes for the calibration process to be finished, and we'd like our system to be able to autonomously calibrate as long as it was a circular dial with one needle. Over the course of this project, we learned many things. One of the most important ones was setting deadlines. As a group, we did a really good job from the beginning of setting hard deadlines for ourselves, which allowed us to complete this project successfully. One of the other things we learned was having a plan B. <laughs> like all problems you, or like all projects, you encounter many problems throughout and many challenges. With these, having plan Bs allowed us to know that we needed to switch from our Arctic, our original Arctic controller to the Raspberry Pi in order to get the resolution and the time we needed. We also encountered problems with Amazon, and because we set those deadlines in December, we were able to finish our problems by January because we had those plan Bs. Last part that was important to making sure that we completed the project was delegating tasks equally between the three of us. Um, making sure that we were all working on different things at the same time and also that we all had about the equal amount of work made sure that we were able to meet our deadlines. It's for the juniors back there. I saw a little bit as well. <laughs> Delegate tasks correctly. Uh, thank you everyone for listening to our presentation. Now's the time for any questions or comments you have. <laughs> so. Basically, any prop, any uh, microprocessor that has similar specs, uh, similar processing speed and power, um, we were able to run on average our code to image process in about five seconds. So it would just require some testing with whatever new microcontroller you'd pick. I don't know an exact one right now. Um, I'd have to look into it. But if we know how long it should take, about five seconds, and it should receive an image about every second. So that's all you really need to know uh, to learn about the different. Uh, to pick a new microcontroller. But the Raspberry Pi wasn't, didn't have enough grunt to do that, right? No, it did not. It would take a lot, lot longer. So if you had a more powerful controller, would it also be able to do what the Raspberry Pi does? The idea of having the two separate units was that it was scalable. So the idea would be you'd have five camera units to one gateway unit, and it'd be more expandable. Because the Arctic microcontroller is so expensive, and the Raspberry Pi is much cheaper by comparison. Um, so that was the idea behind the two separate units. Sure. Yeah, go. Uh, what about Zigbee? Did you look at using Zigbee? Zigbee we did not. Um, basically, we decided to use the MQTT because, uh, kind of just because it worked and also because it was used in the <coughs> Internet of Things. So it was the first thing we tested. We did not uh, test Zigbee as a way to communicate. So Zigbee is used extensively in, inside uh, industrial systems for controlling lights and power and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. It's even logical choice because it's priced. Based on the feedback we got from Samsung initially, they kind of were the ones who pushed us into the MQTT connection. So that's why we went with that. And we were able to get that working relatively easily, so we stuck with that. But that would definitely be something to consider in the yeah. future. It was also really within our, uh, it was fast enough within our, what we wanted. So we had, saw no issues with it, which is why we ended up using it. But that's Bluetooth, right? It, 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 MQTT. MQTT? Yeah, no, it's that's like a, a Wi-Fi wire. connection. It's a Wi-Fi oh, It's like a, it's a... Yeah. Yeah. So ideally, our system would just work on the company's existing Wi-Fi network. Yeah, well, in industrial environments, that's not usually very useful. That's why Zigbee is much more rugged for operating in that hostile environment. There's a lot of experience and so on. And if the customer was using that, I'm sure we could adapt our product to suit their needs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Go. You. So your calibration was done such that you understood the, the angle of so many, you know, so many degrees. How did you then translate that to whatever was actually on the dial at a certain degree? Did you have to code that at any rate one? You didn't have any augmented recognition of the, of the numbers and no, we did not. So that actually, that was kind of like the automatic calibration would be the new thing. Basically, how it worked was uh, because if it was like, imagine if you have a dial that's 30 degrees, if zero, if you pick um, and then it creates a circle, that's 360 degrees. So if you pick 330 and 30 as being zero and 30, it would correlate. So 331 degrees is one, if that makes any sense. So it kind of just split it up. So we did like a math algorithm, basically. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yes, if it was not linear, you would, yeah. So that would be basically, if this was going to be a more improvements, it would be an automatic system to actually read the dial face. Go, you. <laughs> So do you mean using the AWS like I am portion where you create the certifications to allow devices to post to Amazon? Yeah, normally they do a certification code. So mm -hmm. they can integrate with your uh, Python embedded code. Yeah, that's actually what we ended up using with Photo. Um, when you go through and you can create profiles for devices, so we created a profile for our gateway unit and it gives us the two authentication codes and then from there Photo allows you to use those codes because when you use the Amazon Web Services command line interface, you can take those authentication codes and put them in there and then use commands so you can actually control and modulate your entire database. And Bodo allows us to do that same thing with those same authentication commands in our Python code. Great, thank you. Just follow on, in view of what the issue how to keep all the Amazon services, right? I mean, I don't know what kind of services. Is it AWS IoT or complete the Amazon services? Uh, the services we used was AWS IoT, and then they have their own um, rule publishing network within IoT itself, and then we also used AWS Elasticsearch, and then Kibana is attached to that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, go. Can you talk a little bit more on why you were able to achieve a high resolution uh, image up to the RTX microcontroller, what were the technical reasons behind having to add another device? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, originally the plan was to have two separate devices for the scalability, but the reason the Arctic didn't work out was basically we were limited to an I squared C camera, and the resolution you can take on that, I believe, is QVGA, which is about, I want to say it's like 240 by 240 pixels, which isn't quite enough to get accuracy um, based on our image recognition. The image, as you saw earlier, was so blurry that it's even hard for the human eye to read. So that's why, in, a, in addition to our resolution test, we quickly learned that if we used high resolution images, we'd be able to be within our error bounds, which is why we chose that camera. Uh, and I'm not super familiar with it. What kind of, um, with the Arctic microcontroller, what kind of interfaces are available on that? Um, yeah. uh, the only thing we had access to, I believe, on that unit that we were using was the I squared C, and then we had some GPIO ports, but not enough ports to be able to use any other camera that was feasible and cost effective. That was another big, big thing that drove it, was we wanted the camera unit to be. Uh, cheap enough to be able to be scalable since the gateway unit is so expensive. So that also limited our choice of cameras. So the highest throughput um, uh, interface is their Wi-Fi device within? Is that, is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't What's quite understand. What's the question? What wasn't clear is it looked like uh, there was a Wi-Fi connection between each one of these. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. The and the yes. Next to the yes. Um, so we were using two separate Arctic microcontrollers. They have an entire lineup. 710 is the one we use for our gateway unit, and it's the most powerful. And then they have a couple smaller units, which are less powerful and less expensive. So we were going to use one of those smaller units for our camera unit. Does that? Does that answer your question? I don't sense? really get yeah, what you're trying to ask. So. Uh, yeah, come by. We'll <laughs> we'll explain more. Yeah, you go. Yeah. Sorry, what's the question? Like, how long did it take in total? From taking a picture to graphing online, it was about 20 seconds. Yes. Processing. I'm sorry, I don't know. So. Oh, um, so it's image processing. So the basically what how would happen is you had to do several steps with the image. So you, 
we had to kind of like blur or um, harden out the edges, turn it into black and white, turn it into a binary array, find the threshold that it needed to be. So um, I don't know exactly how many uh, like you know cycles it took, but the fact that it was image processing and then it had to find that those circles and those lines, and it didn't just find the right circle and the right line, it would find a bunch, and then it had to pick which was the right line, which was the right circle. So it was just a lot of steps that had to be taken. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of why it took so long, was because it really was image processing, which takes a decent amount of time. Okay, so It was a Python code. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah, basically because it was quick enough within our scale, we didn't look into trying to optimize it particularly. You, go. Did you uh, consider any cloud services to potentially be an alternative to the image processing? So basically press the image up, throw it up to some services based model on the cloud that you, you know, AI-based recognition of some other image processing engines and Amazon or something? Uh, actually, we did consider that in the very beginning. Basically, when we decided to do this project, we were thinking of different ways to do it. So that was actually one way we were thinking of. Part of the reason we chose to do it this way was because uh, we didn't know, we didn't secure knowing how to do it basically by the time we were supposed to start really getting there. Um, I'm sure it's possible, but uh, we just didn't, we put in the time that we had to for the research for that and then stopped. Another issue with that is if there was some sort of spotty connection with Wi-Fi, we'd want to make sure that we capture that data and it was there. And let's say there's a lag in time that they'd still be able to access that data, that you wouldn't lose any data. That was a main requirement we wanted as well. Yeah. Exactly. Um, another thing to add on to that, everything in AWS is pay per use. So the more stuff you bring into the cloud, the more you pay for, the more your monthly cost is. Whereas with the Arctic, it's a one time cost and then you're just paying for the power to keep the device running. So there's kind of that like cost analysis to it as well. Yeah, you in the back. There's, there's currently no solution like this out there that is a retrofit solution for the actual dials. Besides completely ripping out all your equipment, so our cost is, when you break it down, it, I believe it was about $25. We were calculating at a minimum wage rate the hours it would take for a worker to go around and record data points at a clipboard, and our unit falls well below that average. So you'd essentially be taking someone out of the job so they could be doing something else, something more technical. Any more questions? Thank you all very much. Thank you. That's great. What's the PowerPoint with the things? Thank you. What's the PowerPoint with the things? So I can All right. Thank you so much. At this point, we take a short break. Uh, we reconvene in about 20 minutes. I hope you get a chance to talk to the students and also look at the demonstrations. They're really fun. And also, please help yourself. There's food and coffee outside. Okay. Thank you so much again. I, I we po apologize for cutting off your conversation with the students. And I know we definitely have time after the presentation within about an hour and a half. So I'm sure you'll have more chance to talk to the to everyone and then um, get the uh, get the demonstrations, see it. Uh, but before we continue, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I wanted to mention the fact that um, we are very proud to announce that many of the projects that you have heard so far and you will hear in the second sex part of the presentations have actually been have actually received awards from different events and including the recent pitch competition and the science symposium um, at Sonoma State University so we are really proud of all the students uh, engineering students that that participated in these events. This week has been really, really busy for them. We realized that. And I heard that they're actually starting thinking about not letting engineering students participate in any of the competitions because they keep <laughs> winning. So I don't know how it's going to work out next time. So we'll see. Um, but um, 
Anyway, uh, before we continue, I wanted to uh, thank our industry advisors. Uh, we believe that all of these projects that you have seen so far, and you will see, uh, they all had one or two industry advisors. And we really appreciate all the help and assistance and guidance that they have provided throughout the last uh, almost nine months. Uh, in particular, this year, our industry advisors included, I'm going to name them, uh, so we really like to make sure that they have, they know that how much we appreciate their effort. Um, Mr. Robert Rowland from Wireless Gap, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Wireless Gap, that's right. So. Uh, Tom Greer from Trout Unlimited. I don't know if Tom has already left or not. I think he left. Oi. Oi. See ya? Oi. We also want to thank uh, Dr. Christopher Halle from Center for Environmental Inquiries. I think he also left. Uh, he was uh, the industry advisor for the Smart Pick Trap. Uh, we also like to thank Daniel Cliff from Parker Hannafin. I don't know if he's here or not. He was here in the morning. He left. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. We would also like to thank uh, Dr. Wei Zhao from Samsung, who uh, sponsored the Smart Gauge Reader. Um, she, unfortunately, she's not able to come, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we thank her as well. We also like to thank uh, Mr. Shiva Kumar Matapati, who is here, I believe. There you go. Thank you so much. He was, he was kind enough to mentor two of our projects and help the students in various ways. And we also like to thank uh, Dr. Lauren Betts uh, for his continued support throughout many, many different projects from Keysight Technology. I don't know if Lauren is here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for partnering with us. And we hope that if you are interested in participating in any of these events or working with some of the students uh, in the upcoming senior design project, which will be presented here on May 1st of 2020, uh, maybe we, perhaps you can come and talk to us. Um, sorry? We get to him. We get to him. Well, hold on. So I also wanted to thank, the, uh, take this opportunity and extend our uh, extreme gratitude to uh, our uh, lead industry advisor, who is Chris Stewart. Uh, Chris has been extremely helpful. Uh, in fact, he actually star stayed with us on Monday and, and Wednesday until 11.30 to go through all these projects to just do a dry run. And we really appreciate for all of the help that he has uh, provided uh, to all the projects uh, over the last year or so. And um, Chris, thank you so much. So uh, we usually ask, uh, since he has been contributing to a lot of this project in many, many, many different ways, uh, we like to put him on the spot and then perhaps he can just provide some, uh, some of his experience with the students and how it's been so far. And um, we really hope that if you, have any, if you are working, if you have a company outside and you are interested to partner with the engineering department, perhaps you can talk to Chris and then kind of see, get uh, from his inside and then get interested and we hope to hear from you. So at this point I'd like to uh, call on Chris and then perhaps you can just give us a few, uh, some of, give us an insight of your experience with the, working with the students. Thanks Chris. Thank you very much Fareed, I really appreciate it. So as uh, Fareed pointed out, my name is Chris Stewart. I'm the uh, president and co-founder of Pocket Radar Incorporated here in Sonoma County. Uh, have been working with the program for several years. I'm also now the entrepreneur in residence for the School of Business and Economics. So we've been working on bringing some uh, students together across all the different disciplines. As Fareed pointed out, we had a competition uh, of 25 different teams of which uh, Six of our engineering teams won, uh, won prizes. Three of them uh, won first place in their categories. So we were very proud of what they were able to accomplish here. So I've been working with the program here for several years and am uh, very impressed with what's going on here. I think what we have here is a very unique program uh, amongst the colleges that I've recruited from, which are many over the years in terms of what we've actually been able to do to get 
real industry partners, real customers out there, and then give these students an experience across the course of a year to actually solve some real world engineering problems and see how difficult it is to make that happen. I'm sure you were able to hear some things you can relate to as engineers in the audience about some of the challenges they faced and what actually happened. This, this whole program is an incredible experience for the students. I love the fact that we, we have a reunion with the, uh, with the previous year students. I've actually hired several of them myself over the years because they are, they're great uh, students that come out, they hit the ground running. I've talked to other uh, people that have actually hired the students out of the program here and it's been a great experience for them. So I encourage anybody that's interested to get involved with the program. All you really need to do is come up with you know, some way to help support in one way or another. Oftentimes it's just an idea. Also, the industry mentors that is a big experience. I, I would encourage you afterwards to stop by the students and ask about their experience with that. But having the faculty advisor they have on a normal basis and having an industry advisor along with that is, a, I think, a huge benefit that makes it work. So I just want to say thanks. It's my gratitude to be able to get a chance to work with these kind of high caliber students and see how far they've come in the course of this program. And also encourage any of you that are interested in getting involved with that. You can you can reach me at Chris at PocketRadar.com or through the program here. My uh, my information's up on the Sonoma State web, both in the business school as the entrepreneur in residence and through the engineering school as the industry advisor. So thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. At this point, we start with, can we continue with the presentations? I believe we have four more, and um, we have Jorge. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jorge Munoz. Uh, my project was the wine shipment sensor. Uh, my faculty advisor was Farid Faramand. My industry advisor was Adam LePierre. And my clients are the wine distributors in Sonoma County. Uh, you can see there's a website and email along there. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the overview of the background of the industry and identifying the problem, uh, general system overview and the solution, in-depth system description, test results, materials and costs, schedules and change challenges, future works, and conclude with uh, questions. A little bit about the background of the industry. Wine is a $8 billion industry for Sonoma County. And wine is a very delicate product when it's shipped. Taste and smell can be a very high quality value for wine. And a lot of the times it can be altered if it's mishandled in a shipment. The problem here is that wine distributors currently have limited resources when monitoring wine shipments. Here are a couple of the existing products. Uh, first one here is the uh, eProvenance. It has a temperature and a humidity sensor and also a GPS. The pricing for this requires a quote and it determines uh, what you're shipping and they will provide a shipping container for you. Sensors has also a temperature and humidity sensor and it also has a barometric probe design cork to go inside the wine to measure these uh, readings and that's priced around $350. Alertis is the final one, and it has the following as the other ones with temperature and humidity, but it also requires a AA battery and connection to Wi-Fi, and it's priced around $200. So my solution would be to use WINS. It is designed with the sensor tile. It's about uh, 13 point millimeter by 13 point millimeter and then attached to the cradle is a little bit larger in size. So it's uh, low in cost, it's small in size obviously, and it has many embedded sis sensors in it. And I wish to implement all the data gathered with it into an open source Python GUI. So this is a little bit of how the system works. It's uh, rechargeable through a micro USB. Uh, the sensor is placed in a shipping container and when, within there, we begin data logging. And out of there, we display the data on the GUI by retrieving the data on an SD card in the current version. We power on the device, insert the SD card, and begin data logging by doing a double tap on the accelerometer, which causes a gesture to be recognized, and it'll initialize the data logging. You could also double tap to save and double tap to erase the file and 
create a new file. And once the satisfactory results that you receive, you download it and plot it on the GUI. This is a little bit of the block diagram here of the system over here. And the STM sensor tile has a rechargeable battery. It has a two accelerometers, one with a gyroscope, one with a magnetometer, a barometer. It runs on the Cortex M4F, a Bluetooth microphone, and an SD card slot. The SD card slot it will be utilized to run the GUI program. Here are a couple of the key marketing and engineering requirements for the project. Uh, it requires to have a full charge in two hours for the first one with a 10 watt output power block. And the second one would be to power by battery with a day's use and a 100 milliamp hour battery. Measure temperature, humidity, and motion and must collect and save data. Securely attached to the case, reusable adhesive, and to be durable. And has to cost around $120. By, by reducing costs, I used a open source Python GUI program. Here are a summary of the tests conducted, functional tests, and the objectives. Uh, first one is power consumption, and it's associated with the engineering requirements to the right. The first and second one here for power consumption. Data logging is associated with the third one. And secure attachment is with fourth, and plot data and Python GUI are associated with the fifth. So the test results I got from power consumption is that the maximized power output is the maximized power output that I got from the device for satisfactory requirement needs was to power off all the other features within the device and only utilize the ones that I was looking for and also using a five volt power block to increase the charging rate to meet within the boundaries of two to three hours and the lifespan of a about seven hours here. So the test results I conducted from data logging is that I resulted returning a comma separated value file, CSV for short. The sensor generates the file by a double tap gesture and the file management is currently uh, set to save and overwrite on every use. So first step here we have is the device is powered on. And then when it's mounted and initiated, the LED, orange LED will be on. And you just leave the device logging the data. And then once you're done, you tap it to shut it off and retrieve the SD card to get your CSV file. I did a couple of tests for the secure attachment. First one was a light magnet. It had a weak hold and it slightly altered the barometer readings and it wasn't reusable. Second version was to use a mountain putty, mounting putty and currently it is uh, the best solution. It added since it prevented to, this, it made it more shock resistant and reusable and also prevented it from shutting off from a uh, massive shock. The test I have here is the magnet and the mounting putty here. And these right here are a couple drop tests that I've done. So right here I initialized one and then a couple of two in a row. The second test, the following test results here are the plotting of the data. This testing was done by me physically driving in a vehicle and I was just looking for uh, obstructions in the road, basically like potholes, the speed bumps, and there's an occurrence here in my short trip that I hit a couple of bumps on the road. And it can be measured in the uh, g-force really of the acceleration from the accelerometer. The second test I did by uh, actually physically uh, in controlled environment I breathed onto the uh, sensor to increase the humidity level. Our exhaled breath has a, a slightly higher amount of water vapors, so I wanted to see if that would uh, change the readings, and it did, as we see here in the first initial exhale and the second one. So now I'd like to talk about the graphical user interface. It is written in Python, and I imported uh, PyQt libraries, matplotlib, um, and also, I have a couple of functionality buttons on the top, and 
Currently, this plot is a couple of tests that I did for initial drops. And this is for future work, so I'll get to that in a moment. And uh, currently, there is an option to pull the uh, header files from the CSV file to plot the data. And the cursor along the plots gives you an X and Y value. And you also have the option to save the plot on a PNG file. So this is the current and expected and actual results of my schedule. Planning took a little bit longer than expected. Uh, testing as well. Uh, beta did t reach the minimum requirements that I needed. And documentation, I did a little bit shorter than expected. A couple of challenges I faced along the way was uh, collecting and storing the data. When I first started with the code, it wasn't very useful data. It was just a bunch of numbers on a file. So I had to really massage the code and reformat it so it's in a usable manner. And power consumption was another big one because I wanted to know if the sensor would be able to be used within a certain amount of time in the shipment. If it didn't meet the requirements within a day, then the whole project would, uh, would not be useful with the current uh, limitations. So, and I also uh, tested the secure attachment because I wanted to know if the sensor would stay in position and record data accurately on the mounted area and needed to be shock resistant so that any slight readings wouldn't throw it off. This is the uh, final price here. The sensor tile is about $90. It has all these features with the accelerometer and such. And uh, the nuclear board was the microcontroller used to debug and program the file. And also priced around $20 to get the charging utensils and also the mounting buddy. And it came to a final cost of $113.50. $113.50. So the final design here is the GUI, where it's, it basically displays all the numbers in a visual manner. And you could see various sensor values from the device. And there's a file management system where you could save the plot, you could delete the plot, and it saves it with a timestamp so you're able to know when the results were uh, locked. This is going to help wine distributors better determine for future routes and also uh, extra care. So for my future works, I'd like to further develop and add a GPS tracker so that you're able to visualize where along the trip these uh, occurrences occurred. And I want to add a switch to remove any double tap gestures just to make it more reliable and redesign the casing so it looks more appealing to the eye. I also want to add a larger battery or wireless charge capability to increase the duration of the running time. I also want to add a data transmission through Bluetooth so you don't have to constantly pull out the SD card. And also, I forgot to put this on here, but also actually implement LTEM is a suggestion I would look into as well as suggested. And these are my references. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So the current sampling rate I have is uh, to gather data every second, and it's just to uh, make sure I record everything. It's something I, uh, we derived to determine what was the appropriate size for the SD card. And uh, I'm not sure if I answered the question correctly. Well, yes, yeah, so one second. So, so really, if you then the sample rate every you know, 15 seconds or five minutes, Um, currently, I did not test that, and I will look into it in future works. I will measure the voltage output and see the differences between the two intervals. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Did you consider using like a 
Uh, no, I never considered it. Um, I just wanted to keep it with a rechargeable ability. Um, I also didn't want to increase the size. Um, it's a nine volt battery is a little bit bigger than this. Yeah. Um, adding the GPS capability, how do you anticipate, like you mentioned you want to increase the battery power, how do you anticipate that, um, that need once you add the GPS? I will do more tests and see if um, it'll shorten the lifespan of the battery and determine what milliamp hour battery is appropriate for the additional uh, features. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it is plotted with timestamps. Is the timestamp for when the device is turned on or is it real time timestamps for the current time of date of the actual time of data was taken? It's from the actual time the data was taken. Right now, the current system is when you initialize it, you're going to have to like handwrite it or slap a sticker on the, the transported shipment. Yeah. Would the GPS work inside of the truck that's delivering? What? Would the casing cause it to Would the steel, the shell of the truck cause it with the GPS? No, but that's something I would uh, look into uh, to further test and see if that would affect it. What's the expected lifetime of the device? Right now I've been getting around five to seven hours. And what about the uh, expected lifetime of the device? Just um, not, regardless of charge, I'm just curious how long do you have to use the device? Uh, is it expected to be able to use, be used for a year or two years? I'm expecting about over a year to make it more uh, useful. And what size SD card do you recommend for the device? I'm currently using a 16 gigabyte SD card. Is there any concerns about um, flash bar that size and the amount of data you're looking Currently not. Um, it's, uh, the file sizes haven't been too large. They've been in the megabits and uh, megabytes. Hi, I'm Ian Furness. And I'm Kenneth Kleinsmith. And we're here today to talk to you about PLAID, the Powerline Arc Detector, your mobile arc de early arc detection solution with fault mapping. More than $3.5 billion and 98 lives were lost in California wildfires in 2018 alone. Faulty power lines are one of the leading contributing factors as to how these fires began. Typically, you, or, sorry, uh, once a uh, power line insulator cracks or begins to malfunction, arcing occurs, which can result in starting these fires. Typically, utility companies wait for critical failure or customer complaints before addressing these issues. That is why we created Plaid. So in our talk today, we're gonna uh, discuss four main areas and we're going to dive into the big picture, discussing what an arcing signal is, what solutions exist out there, what is Plaid, and a brief system overview. 
So what does an arc signal even look like? An arc can happen on a power line at any discontinuity in the power line, such as splices, insulators, or taps like here in the image. So on the image on your left is what the noise floor in the frequency domain should look like in the absence of an arc. And then on your right is what it looks like in the presence of an arc. As you can see, it looks like a wide band noise signal that goes across all frequencies and it looks like a general noise floor rise in the frequency domain. So some of the existing solutions out there right now are a simple handheld radio with an antenna. Uh, a little bit more complex than that is a manufacturer uh, called Radar Engineers, which makes, again, some handheld uh, options. And then what utility companies typically use, which is infrared cameras. But these all lack in some pretty serious areas, uh, most of which is that they're all reactive. Uh, when there's a problem, they typically wait for a customer or somebody to call in and report the problem. Once that has been received, they send a technician out with an infrared camera to walk around, isolate that problem, and then they call the, the repair crew and uh, uh, submit the service repair ticket. This is obviously very time consuming. And then again, none of these solutions have GPS, mapping, or uh, data storage options. So here's Plaid. This is what we made. And it solves those problems by being proactive, by getting the uh, fault detected early, which clearly saves a lot of time. It has mapping, GPS, and data storage for future analytics. So here's a brief system overview. In order to uh, set up our system, you simply mount a magnetic mount antenna on the roof of any vehicle. And then inside, our system uh, contains a SDR processor and takes in GPS coordinates. And then all of that is saved locally onto your USB drive for uh, display later. So next, we're going to get into the uh, system details, such as the key requirements, the hardware, and software design. So here are a few of the key requirements. Our customer gave us uh, marketing requirements. From those, we, we generated the technical engineering requirements. Uh, four of the main ones that we're going to talk about today are the Monit uh, our system must be able to monitor at least 10 megahertz of bandwidth, detect a fault within 75 feet of the vehicle. We need to make sure that the sample time is below 100 milliseconds, and we need to accurately map the detected faults within 75 feet of the actual fault. Here is an overview of our hardware design. Once again, we have the antenna. It goes into the uh, software-defined radio, or SDR. In this case, we used a Hack RF1. That then is connected with, to a Raspberry Pi as our processor. Uh, it interacts with the GPS and then uh, takes that data, saves it as a GeoJSON file, and saves it locally onto our device using a flash drive USB, which can then be, be removed at the end of the day for visualization. So here's our software design. Upon initial power-up of the unit, the program automatically begins running, and then it, it turns on a green LED indicating to you that it's operating properly. Then it starts to collect the signal data and the GPS data. Once it has that data, then it goes ahead and pushes the signal data through an algorithm that we created and checks that power level against a threshold. If it exceeds the threshold, it combines the signal data with the GPS data and puts that into the heat map layer so that you could see where the problems occurred. If it didn't exceed the uh, threshold layer uh, level, then it, puts, it checks against a timer to see if the last time it's updated, the route map layer is greater than five seconds. If it's been more than five seconds, it again combines the signal and GPS data and puts that into the route map layer. Then we check to see if the save button has been pressed. If the save button's been pressed, it combines all this data together, formats it in the GeoJSON format for mapping, and then safely shuts down the processor so it doesn't corrupt any of your data when you remove the USB. Next, we're gonna cover some of our key test areas. So we conducted a very uh, wide array of tests and uh, due to time constraints, we're only going to talk about just a few right here, which uh, we grouped into sig signal detection because we need to ensure that we can detect an arc and then system processing to make sure that we can analyze that data and successfully save and map the coordinates. So starting with the antenna, uh, an arcing signal is a very broadband signal. And so 
if we maximize the bandwidth that our antenna is able to receive, then we are able to better increase our odds of detecting a, an arc. Uh, our engineering requirements stated that we needed to ha have a center frequency around 140 megahertz with at least a 10 megahertz bandwidth. And for our setup, and uh, for our setup here, we tested the diamond antenna connected to field box, and we were able to obtain a center frequency of 142 megahertz with just under 11 megahertz of bandwidth. And so this uh, test ensured that we uh, this antenna is optimal for our project. Uh, the next test up here is uh, antenna detection angle. So on the left side, we have the test setup. We calculated the minimum and maximum distances from power lines that the vehicle would be, ranging from 15 to 75 feet. We then calculated the angle uh, that the, the power line would be with respect to the, the vehicle. We set up a test arc source at those angles. Uh, using some similar triangles, we moved it much closer to the vehicle. And on the right-hand side, you can see that we were successfully able to detect arcing signals at both of the maximum and minimum boundary conditions. So one of our big challenges early on was signal-to-noise ratio, meaning that our noise floor of our system was very high compared to the signal we were trying to receive. So we had to get that noise floor down. So through the processing gain equation, we were able to predict that with every doubling of the FFT size, we should see a 3 dB lowering of the noise floor. Now we calculated this out and then we measured it and those, our predicted values matched our measured values nearly perfectly. And this was great because we were able to uh, much better receive our signal and reduce any false positives. And it made it a lot easier to determine our threshold level. But when the FFT size went up, we realized that our processing time went through the roof. And that led us to doing the signal sample time versus FFT time test. This, we had an engineering requirement that set our maximum uh, signal sample time at 100 milliseconds. And that was to increase our probability of intercept of this arcing intermittent signal. So we tested again all the FFT sizes to see how long our average sample time was. We found that the optimum point for us that gave us the best the fastest probability of intercept, the best probability of intercept, and gave us the best signal to noise ratio was a 4096 point FFT. The next primary system component that we needed to test was the accuracy of the GPS. Um, we tested our U-Blox Neo 7P against a Keysight Technologies Field Fox with the GPS option mounted with a Trimble antenna. And at first, we were getting values between three to five meters when we were expecting within one meter. But what we found is that the data sheet didn't match reality on our uh, GPS unit. And it said that it would take about 10 minutes to get that sub-meter resolution on the GPS, but it was actually closer to 15 to 20 minutes. After that duration of time, we were able to see values as low as 0 0.88 meter discrepancy, which is about three feet. So lastly, we're gonna talk about the budget, schedule, and future works. So here is our budget. Our predicted project development budget was $1,000. The actual development cost was $650. And a single unit, if we packaged it up today, would cost $540. Uh, that is not including labor. But uh, one way to dramatically reduce this cost is if we were to manufacture our own radio receiver front end since the HackRF was one of the most costly uh, components in our system. But this was due to the uh, development support out there as well as the open source nature of it. Next, we have an overview of the schedule. On the left-hand side, we have the tasks that we broke down. And then this is the full duration of our project. And on the top, we have predicted versus the bottom, we have actual time that it took us. And as you can see, things slowly kind of extended out, which we did expect due to budgeting a buffer at the end of our project. Diving in a little bit more, we have a few more scheduled details. Our functional tests we were able to complete ahead of time. Mapping took half as long as we anticipated. However, the, the detection algorithm was very challenging and we ran into many issues, whether formatting the data, getting the correct data to output, 
Or, uh, and then additionally, in setting our threshold, we, we had many iterations to maximize the threshold so that we can accurately detect the signal. Additionally, the antennas did not match data sheets for the ones that we ordered, and so this caused these two factors, the detection algorithm and the antennas, uh, led to system tests taking longer as well. So some of the things we'd like to see happen in the future for this project would be to remove the USB from the equation completely. We'd much rather that the data upload, uploaded over a wireless network, but this just, just didn't fit within the scope of time that we had for this project. Um, also, it was requested to us during an interview with a PG&E lineman that he would like to see the system incorporated with their software so that it could automatically generate service repair tickets. Uh, we also had interest from a homeowners association, um, and so we thought for them, an optional screen to be mounted on for instant feedback uh, for the driver would be a really great option. And then we also had, um, we'd also like to see it possibly integrated with some smart grid technologies. So we'd like to say thank you to Dr. Mohammed Salem and Mr. Chris Stewart for all their time, effort, and energy that they put into not only us, but our project to really make it what it is today. We'd like to thank Nature Tech for their generous funding. And then uh, if you have any more questions or would like to learn more about what we did, uh, please stop by our table and just hit us with those questions. We'd love them. So thank you all for very much for being here. Yes. Uh, no, we didn't go into a probability of error, but uh, we wanted to, the ham radio band, it starts at 144 uh, megahertz. So, and just below that, in this area, is the maritime military band. And that's actually um, not, I mean, obviously that doesn't really, it's not in this area. So it's pretty flat. There's not a lot of stuff in there to compete with what we're looking for. So there would have to be some anomaly for us to actually detect an error. Yeah, ad additionally, we did uh, test some uh, potential overload scenarios by driving out to uh, the Coast Guard, uh, uh, testing near CHP and uh, a few other areas. Yeah, Runner Park Police and, Department as well. And across the frequency band that we're examining, uh, we were unable to uh, see basically any activity. Yes. How did you do your analysis to make sure your simulated close-up arc was going to represent you know, actual arcs up on poles or you know, further away at the same different intensity and that calibration? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that was something that we struggled with on this, uh, not having actually found an arc. Well, I mean, there was one that we saw, but it was in December, and we didn't actually have a working unit at that time. And yeah. so uh, <laughs> it, was, it was unfortunate timing. Uh, but we just had to basically calibrate it off the source that we had. Yeah, and so our test source uh, is uh, much lower than what we anticipate uh, the power line. What did you do, like a generator or something? It was a, a, micro, a microwave transformer. Yeah, we, create, we built a Jacob's Ladder out of a microwave oven transformer. Yes? So I have two questions. So these parts, are they persistent faults or are they second part of the question is, can you take me through a typical use case for this device, a typical use case scenario? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Uh, so it was basically if the arcs are intermittent or if they're continuous, and then can you walk us through a use case for, the, for this project? Um, the arcs would be an intermittent, which is why we wanted the probability of intercept to uh, be maximized. Um, because just by the nature of an arc, it's going to be jumping across. And they, they typically happen from our interview with the PG&E lineman. Uh, he said they typically happen at night and when it's in the wintertime, when you get a lot of moisture on the lines. So those would be the, the best times to see them. Um, but they'd be on that, I can't, I don't know. But, uh, a typical use case. I'll yeah, and so then uh, going over just a, what is a typical use case, um, there's a few different main areas. Potentially we could uh, deploy these on PG&E vehicles that are already uh, performing services and 
basically just add this to monitor autonomously in the background, save the data, and once they return to the base, then they can just examine that data, see if they see any faults. Uh, additionally, we had some really good uh, ideas generated from the previous uh, presentations that we gave at the symposium. And one of, uh, there's a few different ones, as well as uh, basically having, uh, what is it, it's the, it's uh, basically uh, like the sheriff, like yeah. deployed on the sheriff's vehicles, or even have, uh, we had homeowner uh, agencies talk to us about potentially deploying a standalone device just to continuously monitor their area. And we actually think that a nice next step for this project, because PG&E, as a utility company, they want a lot of testing done on any tool that comes into their processes, even down to the screwdrivers. And so um, it would, it, we need to show proof of, I mean, that this thing really works. So we think that the, nice, the next best step would probably be like the Sonoma County builders, uh, it, building inspectors, because they have a wide variety of routes that they'll travel, they go to the rural areas, it doesn't require a lot of work and it just sits there in the truck and does its work in the background. So that would be, I think, the best use case for us at this point. Yes? So why do you uh, choose to put it on trucks? It isn't preventative in many ways, preventative wildfires. So why on trucks when there's times that they're not out in the field? Why did you choose trucks rather than actually having a network on each tower? And like you said, monitor in real time at all time versus that. And if you can increase the volume, it'll decrease the cost. And this is just scattered throughout California, so it would be necessary. Yeah, that, that, that is a, a very good point. You asked why would we not build standalone systems and already incorporate it. So with the, the smart grid, they are trying to kind of incorporate some of that, but there is a lot of infrastructure, especially in rural areas, that do not get, undergo the maintenance that is required. And so by having it on moving vehicles, you're actually going to be able to sample areas that you would not normally be able to do uh, within deploying it within city limits. Also, if you have a stationary one, uh, this was brought up to us also, there was people who had wineries at the symposium who were interested in having this on their winery to monitor the lines coming in. And um, to have a stationary one, it, uh, you, have, you run into problems with communication networks. So we could, again, probably connect it. I'm sure that Rob would suggest that we do like a, uh, an LTE or a, a GSM option for that but that just didn't fit into the scope of work. And right now, what we saw that it was the best avenue for this was in a vehicle that's traveling around. Yes. So the question is, uh, is there, have we thought about ways to detect arcs further away from the road than 75 feet? Uh, so depending on the frequency uh, that you monitor, you can actually extend or shorten the, the range of detection. And so that's why we opted for the 140 megahertz. Uh, but also to that point, uh, when you start getting further away, if you're thinking of your triangle, right, you're getting further away, the power line's still at the same height. And so that angle is going to get really low and approach zero. And the monopole antenna on a ground plane where it would be placed on the roof it's going to be optimized to be looking up at those. So it's going to make it more difficult. But this can easily be mounted onto like an ATV or a gator or something, some off-road vehicle, uh, which PG&E uses routinely to go out and do maintenance on their more rural uh, networks. Yes. yes. Did you uh, ask PG&E or investigate uh, sort of alternate approach, which would be the hardware signal characteristics on the lines themselves that could be signal processed in a way to just identify the segment that's having a problem, not, not in a certain location, but a certain signature characteristic of uh, signal on the actual wire over like a multi-mile run, you know, a detector. It's part of a smart grid. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think that they do, may have something like that already implemented, but I'm not sure how it works or where. 
Well, we tried to contact pg e a number of times, and it felt <laughs> like we were talking into a black hole. A Everything goes in, and nothing comes <laughs> out. So. Yeah, I, yeah. Additionally, like I, I did talk to some relatives within pg and &E, and uh, yeah, basically they were not allowed to disclose anything. It was our project was timely, but it was kind of too close behind the fire still. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, this might not be a fair question, but uh, did you guys ask PG&E, like, or do you guys have any sense of how long an arcing line is, is present before they notice it? Like, do they have any idea that weeks, months? You know, that's a great question. Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just playing. Uh, no, I'm just seeing because for yeah. your uh, ability to intercept the actual problem, though. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Can I comment on that? Well, yes, please. Yeah, so, so my buddy at PGE said like, they try and pair everything within 48 hours. Yeah. So with their existing tech, so um, the, the ultrasonic system they use at the moment, their, their aim is to, is to get it out of the way for the LGC. It's a, a big deal at the moment. But then I would, I would call my comment on that is that's within 48 hours of somebody uh, complaining about it. So we're trying to get ahead of that complaint. Yeah, and, and oftentimes they'll begin arcing before they start critically failing. And so they'll arc for a while before it becomes an issue and you start noticing interference caused from those arcs or some other uh, more dramatic issues. Yeah, and if you're in a rural area, that may be, that complaint may take even longer to get to. Okay. All right. Uh, we're getting the... <laughs> oh, sorry, was that FFT formed on your Raspberry Pi or the SDI? Formed on the Pi. Okay, and how, what did you use to interface with the SDI and um, you guys run into any gotchas that you can expect to see? Oh, I'm sorry, what was that question? Um, did you guys run into any issues talking to the SDI? Yeah, yes. <laughs> can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, so uh, there is a, a wide variety of issues. Uh, we did use, uh, basically in order to get the SDR up and running, you need to have a lot of specific libraries placed in the right spot. We use GNU Radio, and so uh, while it's very uh, user, uh, it's not user friendly, but you can definitely tweak it exactly how you like. And so there's a lot of challenges uh, getting the output in the correct format. Um, oftentimes we would only get a binary stream, but it was inconsistent, and so uh, we had to do a lot of manipulation of data to get it to output correctly. Yeah, it would, it's also, it, a lot of the programs are designed to work on Windows, and so we had to leverage a lot of forums and stuff to actually get it to work on Linux with the Raspberry Pi, so that was a huge challenge that started day one. All right, if you have any other questions, come talk to us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> I almost started clapping. Huh? I said I almost started clapping. No, I know. <laughs> Thank you. This clicker. Who wants to be in charge of the clicker? Uh, I guess I can. I can. I didn't it's stuck in my it's stuck in my finger. How do I do this? Compact? Why? Everybody else went How do you turn this over? How's it going? Good, how's it going? Good, good. Let everybody get settled in. What? Do you want me to do it? No, I'm just saying you can't see it. The next slide, yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Marr. My name is Priyanka Kara. And my name is Alyssa Wright. And we created Emote. About 1 in 59 children are identified with autism spectrum disorder, according to the CDC. 
Behavior specialists work with individuals on the spectrum to observe, monitor, and assess their clients' needs as frequently as a few times a week. Currently, the problem behavior specialists have are not being able to analyze their clients' emotional behavior as frequently as they would like to. Another issue is that a, a third of the individuals on the spectrum are nonverbal, which can make this difficult for the behavior specialists to develop programs to help the, individ, uh, the client. So that is why we created Emote, a wearable device for remotely tracking emotional behavior in real time. So first we're going to go over the big picture. Some existing solutions on the market today are AngelSense, which is a GPS and voice monitoring system for children with special needs. Um, parents are updated with real-time location on their children, but this has no emotional tracking. And then there's an E4 wristband, which has an, a galvanic skin response sensor, a pulse sensor, event tracking, and an accelerometer. This is also sent to a mobile application, but there is no pre-processed algorithm for mood tracking. And all of this information is sent via Bluetooth, um, which means that the user needs to be near the device that's collecting the data at all times. Here are some of our most important marketing and engineering requirements. First, our device must detect a change in emotional behavior, which we do using a galvanic skin response, electromyography, and a pulse sensor. All of this sensor data needs to have a 95% accuracy. It also needs to maintain a connection to our server at all times, which we're doing using LTE CAT M1 on our Boron microcontroller. We need um, secure user access on our MySQL database, and of course we need a sufficient battery life so that our user can wear the device all day for eight to 10 hours. So here's our system overview. We have three main components in our system. We have our wearable, our database, and then our app. Our wearable connects to our database through LTE M1, and then we have an app which extracts the data from our database and um, displays it in a user-friendly format for our users. Next, let's talk about the design and implementation stage. First, we have our wearable device. Inside the wearable device are all of our hardware components. That includes our Boron microcontroller with uh, three of our main sensors, the GSR sensor, pulse sensor, and electromyography sensor, along with a GPS sensor. All of these sensors are collected in the Boron microcontroller and is all powered by a lithium polymer battery. All the data that is collected in the microcontroller then gets put into the particle cloud, which is then processed in our MySQL database, which is in our Raspberry Pi, and all of this can be viewed on our mobile application. Here are some of our main hardware components that we used. First, we used our uh, boron particle our particle boron microcontroller. One of the reasons why we chose this boron uh, microcontroller is the LTE M1 capabilities. It also has a very fast uh, data transmission rate and it has a lithium polymer battery connector. Um, and next is our GPS module, which detects uh, your, the location of the user and gives a timestamp along with that location. Next is our uh, electromyography sensor, which detects uh, muscle tension. Next is our pulse sensor, which is heart rate. After that is the galvanic skin response, which is the conductivity of uh, the skin. With all three of these sensors, we created an algorithm to detect spikes in emotion. Lastly is our lithium polymer battery, which is a 3.7 volt battery with 1,000 milliamp hour current capability. Uh, we chose this battery because all of our components need to be powered, and especially because our boron microcontroller has a high peak level um, LTE peak level of 490 milliamps. So here is our software overview. Um, we began by pulling our sensors, as Mackenzie mentioned, which were galvanic skin response sensor, electromyography sensor, the pulse sensor, and then the GPS. We then test to see if a certain threshold has been surpassed. If it has not, then we mark it as either um, average or low, and we store that into our microcontroller. If it has been surpassed, we classify the mood as high and an LED indicator goes off on our device and then that is stored on our uh, microcontroller as well. We then transmit that data into our database and then on our app um, side we have a login prompt and if an incorrect login is entered there's an error display and um, if a correct login is entered we then pull our data from our database and, a, um, and the data is displayed on our user interface. Here is all of the software we use to develop our system. 
Um, the particle cloud is integrated with their IDE, which is using Arduino INO language based on C++. We use this to program all of our sensors. Then we use JavaScript to take all of that data from the cloud and put it into our database. Then there's a PHP script that has all the sensor data, and that is called in our mobile application, which is developed using React Native and can be viewed on Expo. Then we're going to be going over the testing and verification. Our first functionality test will be um, the GSR, measuring the GSR accuracy. So we have our setup, which is the GSR uh, probes are on the arm. And here you can see that when the test subject is resting, it's a steady analog signal. And when she begins to laugh, it decreases. As, every, as we know, everything goes back to Ohm's law. And when the current decreases, the conductivity increases when you begin to sweat more. So we can say that our GSR accurately detects a change in skin conductivity. Then our second um, functionality test is that our checking our pulse sensor accuracy. We compared our pulse sensor results to the traditional reading of finding a pulse on your arm and counting the beats per minute. Um, we did three different test runs, one when the test subject was sleepless, one when she was caffeinated, and another when she was active or running for five minutes. Um, our pulse sensor has an LED and a photodiode that measures the light reflected back from your skin when there's a, um, a pulse, and it does this with a 90, more than 95% accuracy. Our third functionality <coughs> test is the uh, accuracy of our electromyography sensor. The electromyography um, probes are placed in the same direction of your muscle on your forearm. The electrodes measure, it ele measures the current flowing through the electrodes, and um, we can see that it accurately detects when there's a change in muscle tension. Here is our elevated emotion detection test. Uh, in order to do this test, we needed to put our test subject into a very stressful environment. Uh, this was done through a virtual reality uh, system. And play the video. Oh. It won't play. It won't play. Anyway, so. Um, we have our VR system with us, so if you would like to see this demo in live motion, please come by our table afterwards. Um, by doing this test, we created our algorithm and got thresholds for each one of our sensors um, to identify certain thresholds. Oh my God. Okay, one of our biggest challenges was connecting to our server um, for the mobile app off of the same network. Um, since the school Wi-Fi has high security, we took our server off campus and we enabled port forwarding and we were able to accurately grab data from the server onto our mobile app remotely. Next, we're going to be talking about our performance test. Here is our battery life test. Our battery life test consisted of testing the voltage of our battery over a, a period of eight hours as it was powering all of the components of our device. Uh, we then came to the conclusion that we wanted to conserve uh, the battery consumption, so we decided to send our data over a four minute interval. Um, with this test, we can conclude that the, um, this will help our boron board keep its LTE M1 connectivity, because if the uh, boron board goes below 3.6 volts, we will lose our LTE M1 connectivity. Here's our LTE M connectivity test. Uh, we conducted this test with two phones, one phone being with the Boron microcontroller going to a remote area. The second phone is with, um, in, that has service collecting data from the Boron microcontroller. Um, as you can see in the upper right hand corner, the, Boron, uh, the phone with the Boron microcontroller has no service at 4.39 p.m. And as you can see below that photo, there is a timestamp from the boron microcontroller at 4.39 p.m. So we can conclude that the boron board has at least 20 dB stronger LTE M1 signal strength than a cell phone LTE signal. We wanted to assure that our GPS module is getting an accurate location. To get a correct location, our GPS needs to have a fix on a minimum of three satellites. So to do this, we um, compared our latitude and longitude that was stored in our database, compared that to um, location in our Google Maps, and we found that the location um, shown on our mobile application is the same as that on Google Maps. 
Now we're going to be talking about our user experience test. So this test was not forcing to come. While we were testing each one of our sensor sensors on our test subject, we found out that the uh, test subject was allergic to nickel. So our GSR and EMG both are made out of nickel. Each one of those sensors has nickel. The probe is made out of nickel. So 10 to 20 percent of the population is allergic to nickel. So this was a huge problem that we needed to solve. So by doing this, we applied copper tape to the subject for four hours to make sure that the subject was not allergic to the copper. Um, copper is a conductor, so that way we can relay our analog signal to our microcontroller. Next, we're going over our materials and costs. So here are a list of our main components used in our system, which came to be a total of $259.18. We also had a $299 LTE subscription per month. Here's the timeline for our completed project. There were a lot of unforeseen changes that we had to accommodate for. First, we had originally decided to do Toddler Buddy, which was a device that monitored children's visuals, but we found this to be too intrusive for young children, and there was a higher demand for emo. We also had to change our EMG sensor because our original one had gel electrodes that had to be replaced every time it was used, and this was making it less wearable, accessible, and very much less so, um, cost efficient. Um, also, the sensors were a lot more difficult to program than we had expected because a lot of the available resources were for Arduino and not the Boron, um, and it has different peripherals, like the Boron has a 12-bit ADC instead of a 10-bit ADC, and there are also no available hardware timers, and so we had to implement, figure out how to implement software timers in our code. And now we'll be going over the future improvements and perspective. So future improvements, we'd like to have a greater pool of data from a diverse amount of um, diverse group of people so that we have better calibrations for our device in the future. We'd also like to replace our GPS um, module with a GSM implementation, and we'd like to compact our design even more using PCB. We'd also like to have um, the ability to have uh, multiple users and multiple devices. And we'd like to improve our user experience. So we'd like to have users be able to customize their own emotes and um, have it more comfortable for their everyday, everyday use. We'd also like to have a battery level indicator on the device and a re remote um, sleep and wake up on the device as well. So we collaborated closely with behavior specialists to design emo around uh, their client's needs. So the goal of this project was to create a wearable for remotely tracking emotional behavior in real time. And Emo is a small engineering feat that helps us effectively, reliably, and securely share their emotions. We would like to thank Fareed Fairmond, Dr. Mohammed Salem, Rob Rollins, Dr. Sarah Cassis, uh, Ryan Boyle, and Chloe Hunter for the continued support and guidance through this project. We would also like to thank Source and the Sonoma State Electrical Engineering Department for the funding of this project. Please download the Expo uh, app and use this QR code to try our Emote app. Thank you. So the wearable will, will go onto the forearm and all the sensors will be on this side of the forearm while the, uh, all the actual sensors are on top compacted in a um, device. Yeah, could we? all range of emotions. So you could be happy, you could be stressed, angry. We haven't identified each one of those uh, emotions yet, but that's... Um, We'd have to get into the brain to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but any spike in emotion? Uh, yes? Any other applications in lie detection? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it does have pulse, so if your heart rate does and go up... Sweat. And you sweat. And you sweat, so... <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned calibration. Do you have to calibrate to a baseline per person right now, or is it statically um, is it statically programmed? Or right when you put it on, does it get right sort now, of the baseline? Right now, we have um, on the fiber? inside, the sensors are connected. Um, the sensors are connected to Velcro, so obviously my pulse may be different than where your pulse is on your arm, 
and your muscles also will be in different portions. Um, so those do need to be moved around, which we do have right now are connected to Velcro, so we can take them on and off and place them properly onto the specific user. Yes, in the back. So this is a device that would be provided by a medical professional to one of their patients. Is there a chance that this might need to go through uh, an FDA approval regulatory process? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we were testing on the actual clients or any other like people besides, she was the test subject, I was the test so subject. we didn't have to do any forms, but there was a form that we had to fill out if we were going to do that, so definitely yes. So that's in our future works. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you. Good job. All right, this is not too bad. Sure. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Jonah Baumgartner. I'm Ryan Kiambao. And I'm James Normantis. And this is our Senior Design Project Pocket Site. We'd also like to acknowledge our faculty advisor, Don Estridge, our industry advisor, Chris Stewart, and our client, Pocket Radar. This is a list of topics we will be discussing throughout our presentation, but first, we're going to talk about the problem. So there's a lot of hybrid electric cars out there. And while that's very good for the environment, it causes a huge cause for concern for pedestrians because they're so hard to hear at low level speeds. This is causing an even bigger concern for pedestrians with visual impairment as they can not only not see the car, but cannot hear the car as well. So here's some existing solutions that uh, for people with visual impairment, we have a GPS system where the user has a wearable and it will guide them to their destination, giving them haptic feedback, steering them left or right. We also have these short-range object detection systems, which typically require a large computer to operate them. Uh, I want to stress that none of these are actually designed to help pedestrians cross the street. Our solution is a lightweight handheld device that a user will walk up to an intersection and point down the road. They will receive feedback if there are any moving vehicles within range via an LED array and sound output through headphones. The speed of the vehicle is reflected in the beeping rate of the headphones and the blinking rate of the LEDs. The distance of the vehicle is reflected in the pitch of the beeping and the number of LEDs that are illuminated. If the user uh, points the device and there are no moving vehicles, they will receive no feedback. And this uh, indicates to them that they can make a decision on whether it's safe to cross the street. So after conducting a series of uh, surveys and questionnaires with our potential clients, such as the people at the Blind Center in Santa Rosa, and the actual client that called into Pocket Radar for this device, here are four of our key project requirements that we uh, developed to ensure the functionality of our device, including the range that they can pick up a moving car, how accurate it detects the car's speed, uh, how quickly it can update the user, and the directionality. So here's a high-level block diagram of our system. We have our radar module transmitting a signal at 24.125 gigahertz. If there's a moving vehicle in the area, that signal will come back at a shifted Doppler frequency, which will get picked up by our radar module and mixed down. That mixed down signal will go through an amplifier, level shifter, and a low-pass filter, which will go into our ST microcontroller, which will go through some signal processing, which then we can uh, notify the user via headphones and or LED array. This is our full system overview. Our device is powered by two AA batteries. This voltage is stepped up to five volts with our voltage boost converter to power our radar module and our microcontroller. This is also stepped down to 3.3 volts via our low dropout regulator to power the rest of our system. There are two buttons on the device. One is the transmit button for when the user is ready to start be, uh, be, being given feedback. The other one is the notification choice button, which they can choose either sound output, light output, or both. The signal that comes back from the, reflected from the vehicle is a much smaller amplitude, so we amplify the signal and level shift it to fit, to fit the range of our analog to di digital converter, which is 0 to 3.3 volts. We also filter out higher frequency noise. Um, our microcontroller outputs through a digital to analog converter, which gives a sine wave to our audio amplifier for our headphone jack. We also 
power the LED array with the microcontroller. So here's a software design block diagram for our microcontroller. As soon as we power on the device, we go through an initialization process, initializes our ADC, GPIO pins, etc. Once the user presses the transmit button, then we will start taking readings. Uh, since the readings come back at a DC offset, we shift that down to be centered at zero, apply our window function, run a 1024 point fast Fourier transform, or FFT. We did this process three times as we want to take the average of three FFTs. Once we take the average, we find the maximum number in that array and at what position it's at. If that max number is higher than our set noise threshold, we will then calculate the speed and then alert the user. So to coincide with our marketing and engineering requirements, here's a list of four tests that we conducted to ensure the functionality of our device. The first test we conducted was the range. We wanted to ensure that the user had enough time to make a decision on whether or not it was safe to cross the street. So if we do some math and see how fast a car moves uh, at a residential area, about 25 miles an hour, we can see that it travels about 36 feet per second. With a range of 500 feet, this gives the user about 13 and a half seconds to make that decision. But we also wanted to account for all the people that are driving above that speed limit, uh, hence the 50 miles per hour, which uh, as you can see from the linearity of this equation, we can just divide that uh, 13 and a half seconds by two, which at the worst case scenario of 50 miles per hour gives the user about, six, about seven seconds. Uh, we conducted this experiment by connecting our device to a computer, which we could then see a visual of when we were receiving a signal. Compare that to our police issued radar, uh, LIDAR, where it would then give us a, a display of the distance and we would then write down at what distance we saw our signal at. So as you can see on the left, on the right, on the left. Uh, you can see that, that we tried it with many different cars to see how our average speed would, our average distance would be, concluding that our average maximum distance we could pick up a car with our device would be around 630 feet, with an uncertainty of about plus or minus one foot, thereby exceeding our engineering requirement. With the same setup as the last test, we wanted to ensure that the user had a good sense of how fast the car was moving. So using the Doppler equation, we can see this relationship between frequency and speed and see that for every mile per hour is equivalent to about 72 hertz. With this in mind, we can then take the frequency that we are receiving from the radar module, divide it by 72 to get a good sense of the speed, and then compare that to what we were reading on our LiDAR. Our results showed that we were very close to what the LiDAR was reading with our Biggest uh, difference being about minus two, concluding that our device's speed accuracy was about plus one, minus two of, from the LiDAR, thereby meeting our engineering requirement. So this is our duration of code test. Basically, how long does it take for the user to receive feedback once they push the transmit button? Like I said before, we're taking a 1024 point FFT. So what we did was we connected an oscilloscope to a pin, which we set high throughout the duration of the notification process. The signal on the right the high signal shows the time that it takes from, from the time the user pushes the transmit button to when they receive a notification. After running six tests, each of them came out to 790 milliseconds with an uncertainty of about two milliseconds due to the cursor uh, resolution, thus meeting our engineering requirement. Another important test we conducted was our beam width test. We wanted to ensure that our device was both directional enough so that the user would have a good idea of where the vehicle was coming from, but not too narrow of a beam width uh, so that they might point and miss the vehicle. We conducted this test by putting our device on a programmable turntable. We received uh, the signal from our device with a horn antenna connected to a spectrum analyzer where we would read the received power at each degree. Um, we generated this polar plot as seen on the right and the red lines indicate the uh, half power beam width which we found to be 34 degrees with an, inaccur an accuracy of plus or minus one degree due to the uh, resolution of the turntable. This met our engineering requirement. So here's a long list of challenges that we faced throughout the duration of this project. However, due to our time constraint, we will only be talking about the ones that are highlighted in yellow. The first uh, problem we were facing was reaching our required range of 500 feet. At first, we were reaching about 300 feet, uh, but we were powering our radar module from 5 volts from the microcontroller, and that was not giving it enough current to optimize its range. We then switched over to powering our radar module directly 5 volts from the uh, from the voltage boost converter. Also, the window function we were using, while it had a, a good frequency resolution, did not have great amplitude resolution. Therefore, we made the trade-off switch to a flat top window, which has, or sacrificing some frequency resolution to get better amplitude resolution. Also, we were, do, we were not doing any averaging. As shown in the graph on the left, we have our peak noise at about minus 41 dB full scale. 
we went, after doing some averaging, we were able to drop that noise flow, or that peak noise by about 3 dB, thus increasing our range by about 20% due to the uh, radar range equation. Uh, I also want to point out real quick that uh, these lines here on the, on the, the you can see these high, uh, low frequency components. Uh, we are only reading down to four miles per hour, and that line there represents the cutoff from where we're reading. The next challenge we came faced with was the stability of our amplitudes. This was to go inside with the range of our device, but to uh, let the user know how far the car was. So at first we tried to measure the magnitude or the signal strength in the frequency domain. So basically see how strong the signal is. But due to multipath, it wasn't very stabilized. So then we thought we would try and make measurements in the time domain and we just measure the max peaks to account for the multipath. However, we couldn't average in time, which means that we lost our range and uh, uh, due to the signal to noise. So to account for that, what we did is we took different cars, a small, uh, Ryan's small car and James's truck out into the parking lot, measured it with our device, and would see what type of measurements we were giving at certain distances. On the left, you will see that our graph coincides with the range or range equation to when we were then able to convert it into a log scale, which gave us a more linear relationship uh, to which we were then able to divide that into four different ranges of distances to let the user know how far the car was. Another issue we faced was that our radar module was sensitive to voltage changes. Um, when the LEDs or the headphones would pull current, we would see a bouncing voltage at the supply. This bouncing voltage was then seen at the output of the radar module, which would then be amplified before putting into our analog to digital converter. Um, as you can see from the graph on the left, this was a large signal. This was a large signal about two volts peak to peak. Um, in order to combat this issue, we inserted a thousand microfarad capacitor at our five volt supply. This acted as a charge reservoir for the uh, LEDs and this, the headphone to pull cur <coughs> current from quickly, thus stabilizing the voltage at the supply. Um, this resulted in a much smaller amplitude of signal, about 200 millivolts peak to peak, which you can see on the graph on the right. Um, to further improve this, this, we could also insert large capacitors at the 3.3 um, volt supply and the radar module. However, in order to keep our device as compact as possible, we had to make the trade-off um, of not inserting these and being satisfied with our uh, result on the right. Next. Another issue we faced was that we had an interfering signal from our voltage boost converter. Our voltage boost converter had a low uh, power mode where it would mo constantly modulate its switching frequency depending on the required current draw. Um, this created us problems because this modulation led to spikes within our five kilohertz band. You can see these spikes in the plot on the left. Um, what we did to Look, to fix this issue is we uh, looked through our data sheet and found that um, the voltage boost converter could be taken out of this low power mode where it would remain at a constant switching frequency. Without this modulation, we, did, we no longer saw any those spikes within our five kilohertz band, which is shown in the plot on the left, the frequency domain plot, the lower one on the right. The last challenge we're going to talk about is the optimization of our low-pass filter and amplifier. This was the component that was taking the small signal that our radar was receiving and amplifying it into a level that the microcontroller could process. As you can see on the left, uh, there is a problem with our gain, and that was due to the uh, value of our capacitor at the input of our filter. This was causing an issue to where at different frequencies or at different speeds, it was changing the gain or how much it would amplify the signal for our microcontroller. Uh, to fix this, what we did is we increased the capacitor at the input to decrease the impedance at different frequencies, thereby leveling out our gain, which you can see on the right, so that our uh, readings would be more accurate. So this is, our, this is our final product cost. It came out to about $93.46. Uh, we want it to be, or with our most expensive component being our radar module at $50. Uh, we, our goal was to be under $200, so as you can see, we had a savings of $106.54. Uh, for the final implementation of our product, we went from a messy group of breadboards and long wires, as you can see on the left, uh, to a P, uh, PCB that we designed and uh, soldered surface mount components on it to create a uh, compact device that you see here. Uh, unfortunately, we were only given about nine and a half months to complete this project, but if we were given a more time, there are a lot of improvements that we wish we could have further uh, developed, uh, including the shape and size of the case, perhaps making it uh, 
cordlessly rechargeable, adding an internal speaker to uh, get rid of the headphones, as well as a better uh, notification for the battery. Uh, these are some of the supported courses that helped us throughout this, throughout this project. These are our references. We also have a demonstration video at our table if you want to come check that out. And with that being said, we'll take any questions or comments. Uh, one of the issues with vibration uh, with something like a, a radar module is that the radar module relies on the, the shifted frequency that comes back from something moving, basically. And so um, an issue with that is that if the actual device is moving, that, that can start to pick up readings. Because even though it's staying at a, like a constant distance from the ground or something, it could still take a reading because it's kind of moving. So it creates that kind of shifted frequency when, when you don't want it to much. So that, that's one of the the reason, because that was a, something we originally planned to have on this device, but found that it, it, it could be a challenge. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, the cars are going to know a lot of you have these Doppler radars on, especially if you go more towards autonomous driving. Is there any concern for interference from these devices? Um, and the second question is in the regulatory space, how much power is your antenna out to? Is there any concern for the, the user uh, and potentially people in the car for um, power incident? For, for what? Power incident upon the driver's cars. Power incident, so like, we're, like actually being hit with a radar signal. Okay. Um, so, so, the first question is yeah. from other cars. Second question, human impact. Okay. Sure. So we have a, like we said, we have a, we have a low pass filter that uh, only operates in the band that we were operating in. Sorry, yeah, the, the, question, the first question was uh, with the uh, new cars, would the signals that the cars were emitting cause uh, problems with our device taking it readings for the user? And the thing with that is that uh, we don't think that would cause a problem because of our low pass filter. Again, it filters off all the frequencies that are not in our band, which we saw from the Doppler equation. So we can just multiply 50 by uh, 72 which will give us about 3.6 kilohertz. So if the signal is above that, um, then it probably won't cause an issue. Uh, as far as the second question goes. Uh, the, the, output, the output power of our radar module is 19 dBm. Um, that, as, as far as how that would affect the user, um, by, the time it, by the time it gets to the user in the car, it's going to be um, a lot less in amplitude. It spreads out by 1 over r squared, 1 over the distance squared. Um, so that's, that's not a huge amount of power. Uh, that's being, especially if they're at a further distance, that's actually like really minuscule amount of power. As far as what, what's reflected back, um, our half power beam width is 34 degrees. So um, and is, and as you get wider and wider, um, that, that diminishes even further. Um, so I'd, I wouldn't see that being a huge concern. Um, but that, that'd have to go into more like medical testing about how like a, a radar signal or electromagnetic signal affects the body and stuff like that. But I don't see it as a huge amount of power or anything like that. So the cell phones do have a long time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What happened if like a, a police was down the street, you know, if any radar measurements on any uh, car at different speeds and it hit your device, would there be any negative impact of the operation? To the operation? So yeah. The LiDAR has like a, it has, it acts like a laser, so you really have to pinpoint to put your eye through, and you really have to pinpoint. So the odds of them pointing it at you are like, unless they're trying to mess with you, I can't really see that being an issue because they're supposed to be pointing it at the car. So what do you think would happen if that, if that did occur? Like a police light? Oh, I see. What you're, so police LiDAR or radar? Uh, the ra like a radar. Right. Depending on how far it is, we actually do pick up some signals. Um, if we have like this computer on right now, we took it out, I think we might be able to read some of it. So depending on how close it was, it would affect it. But um, that's, that's if they're like, you know, how far I am right now. Yeah, there, there, there could possibly be interference with that signal. I know like one thing we've actually tried is like taking our device and pointing it, putting a pocket radar at it, uh, with it and like pressing both of the transmit buttons. And sometimes we do get readings, so there, there can be interference between the two signals, especially if they're at the same frequency. 
times that it's possible. And is there any risk for the user thinking that it's safe to walk out? It's like they come up to a street, but there's a police radar. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, how, again? Maybe it's good for I feel like yeah, it'd just be. I feel like it's just like an unlikely thing. situation. It could happen. Very well, could happen. But I think the likeliness yeah, of it. Pointing it, maybe, you know, maybe at the same time, same direction. Yeah. Uh, perhaps there's a possibility that it, it could be reading. It's, they're also further away, so they're going to be receiving less of that signal. Uh, but I mean, that could be a test. So yeah. maybe for future testing. Uh, yes. So I was thinking about you know, practical use of it. Suppose I am at the side of the street and I. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about the reaction time of the person who is using this and how long will it take for them or an average person to cross the street and during <coughs> that time, even if you didn't detect any cars with a speeds of about 25, 30 miles an hour, would they reach you or have you done a study like that? Well, yeah, yeah, well, we actually did. Uh, when we did our range equation, we were thinking about, um, well, how, how far, or a car moving at, like, you know, residential speeds, 25 miles an hour. Uh, we, we had that equation up there. It took about 13 and a half seconds for them to get from 500 feet to where they would be. Um, so we think that would be enough time for them to make a decision and then possibly, like, go make it across the street. And I mean, that's assuming that the car won't see them and slow down. Like, they'll probably end up seeing them and then, you know, obviously slow down for them. And we're trying to have this device be intended for the user to then make their decision. We're not trying to have this give, be the answer and the only answer there. So we're just kind of have it like a, like a second uh, opinion, almost. Yeah, to give them a safer idea about their surroundings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Uh, you <laughs> So, did you guys test you know, like new electric vehicles, self-driving vehicles, by emitting their own proximity sensors, their own radar? Did you guys consider that, or what happened in that case? Uh, Will there be some cancellation or some distortion? Yeah. Um, well, we didn't really get to test that. We didn't really have any of those vehicles that we, you know, that we have access to, so we didn't get to test that. Um, I would imagine there would be some interference if. You know, depending on what, what kind of range or frequency that that thing is operating at, but we weren't able to test that because. So you, you, you thought about it? Yep. That was a yeah. 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 Okay. So you mentioned uh, that if the user is standing at like an empty intersection, that they shouldn't get any feedback. Yeah. Yeah, so you can you can just hit the notification button to see if it's still working. And if you want to see if it's like really working, you could just also wave your hand in it to see if it'll re read anything. If you really want to tune it, you can get uh, a tuning fork that the police use to test their uh, radars and lidars and see how it compares to that as well. If you want to take it to that feed, but yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. How, how was the interference of, oh, the high frequency components? Um, well, that, that's one of the main reasons we have a low pass filter. Um, our, our radar module is operating at a very high frequency, which is 24 gigahertz, 24 um, So that, that's one of the reasons we had a, uh, a low pass filter uh, at the input of our ADC, just to filter out any extra noise and possible interfering signals at higher frequencies. I think what he was asking is, what difference did you see between the interference signals when you had a breadboard with all the wires and when you had a PC board? Huge difference. It changed literally everything. Um, we were getting a lot of issues with it with regards to how we were reading our speed, our amplitudes and whatnot. And we would show people our device and they'd be like, oh, well, there's your problem. You got all these wires everywhere. And we didn't realize how much of a difference it would be when we design and fabricate our own uh, PCB. So if there's anybody out there that wants to make a project, I suggest uh, you can just design your PCB. It's super easy. You can just go online and just find something like that. So that's what we did.
Yeah, and we, we, did, we did have a, a drop in our noise floor. We, we don't have any plots here to show, but we did, we did see a drop in our noise floor, which w basically was, besides compacting our device, was the main reason we wanted to go to the PCB. All these long inductive wires were adding a lot of noise to our system. Is that your question? Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much. We also want to thank uh, Fareed and Chris for all their support, and thank you guys for coming. And Don. And, and Don. And Don. Don. Don't forget Don. <laughs> Thank you so much again for joining us. This brings us uh, to the end of our 2019 Senior Design Project. We really appreciate you guys being here and sticking until 12.30. When we started at 9 o'clock, it seemed like forever, but it just passed so quickly. So I hope you enjoyed all the presentation. I would like to, at this point, congratulate all of our seniors for their great presentation. Please join me to give them a big round of applause. Thank you. I also like to take this opportunity to thank all of our, all of our faculty members for the, all the mentoring and the great help that they, uh, their, their role in developing all of these concepts and helping the students. I would like to name all of our faculty members who help with uh, these projects, starting with Dr. Mohammed Salam. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Don Estridge. Uh, oh, Dr. Ali Kujuri, <laughs> Dr. Sudhir Sharesta, <laughs> Dr. Sarah Kessis, <laughs> and Dr. Said Rahimi. I also like to thank our Dean Stoff, our uh, Dean, Dr. Stoffer. Unfortunately, she had to leave. She was here uh, in the early morning uh, for all the support, uh, supporting the engineering program and initiative. Thank you to all of you again for being here, for helping. But, but, last but not least, I like to recognize two key individuals who really made this whole thing happen. And without them, there would be no way that we could put this event together. And those are Sharam Maniwani. <laughs> and Kate Lab. Thank you. It was, it was truly through their hard work and organization that we were able to put this event together. And uh, we really want to thank everyone, including these two individuals, for all the help that they have provided throughout the last nine months, especially towards, to the students and to the department. So thank you again. <laughs> we are truly grateful for having such amazing students, faculty members, industry partners, and staff and uh, at this time, I would like to, again, invite you to join us in any way you can, get involved with the program, and I hope we can see you next year. But before you go, um, I also wanted to mention that the uh, engineering department this semester started a new EE challenge. So throughout this challenge, we basically pose a very difficult engineering problem to students, and we ask them to solve it. And I want to invite Dr. Salem to come and, and uh, announce the winner of this month. <laughs> You're going to have to come. <laughs> so the winner of this month is... Drum roll. Drum roll. David Story. David Story. So we present the winner with a $25 gift card. The gift card is a generous donation by Professor Don. Thank you, Don. What was the problem? What was the problem? Well, I'm not going to give That's the solution, a secret. but yeah, you can find <laughs> it on the web. You can go to the department website, go to the Q margin link, and then you can find all the challenges over there. And I would also like to take this opportunity to uh, make a connection with our industrial partners if they would like to contribute to the Q margin channel, whether 
to provide problems or to provide financial support. But yeah, please get in touch with us. Uh, would like to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. And that brings us to end. Once again, congratulations to all of the students. And thank you again for your great presentations.